Well, good morning, everyone. It's uh, Wednesday, January 18th, and we're going to uh, start the morning by talking in, um, in regards to uh, uh, the Right to Farm Bill. And um, uh, last year, last year uh, the bill was in in uh, the House passed it over, but it ended up in judiciary and kind of got stuck there and and uh, so we're we're back at trying to update that uh, law and uh, we uh, we have with us uh, uh, our last person Michael Grady and, uh, Bill Bill Rowell is with us uh, uh, farmer from Highgate, uh, also folks from uh, the uh, Department uh, Agency of Education. And uh, I think um, I've worked off and on this uh, fall with uh, Bill and Amanda uh, to try to get some language that the committee might be able to use to um, update the uh, present uh, right to farm law. Um, the, uh, I don't know, um, we'll run around the room and introduce ourselves uh, and then we'll get our guests to introduce themselves and we'll get started. Brian Collamore, the Senator from Rutland County. Irene Renner, Chilton Park, which includes Fairfax and Franklin County. Brian Campion, Bennington County. <coughs> Rich Wesley, Memorial County. And I'm Bobby Starr from Orleans County. <coughs> so, um, Laura, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, good morning. Uh, Laura DePetra, the Director of Water Quality at the Agency of Agriculture. Good morning. Steve Collier from the Agency of Agriculture. Michael Grady, Legislative Council. Emma Schulder, Vice with William Schulder and Associates. I'm Tucker Burgess from Fairmont Farm here in East Montpelier. Um, and we have Linda Lehman, who's our um, various able uh, assistant. Um, and um, I don't know, Michael, did you want to give us a little overview of, um, of um, where, when this all started and, and uh, the last time it had been updated and something like that? But, Sure. I mean, the right to farm law was first enacted, I believe, in 2000, and, no, actually 1985 or 1981. It was amended the last time that I know of in 2003, 2004. And that was in response, in part, to an Iowa Supreme Court case that had ruled that a similar law in Iowa affected a taking of neighboring property. Consequently, the General Assembly had revised its law to address that and also to address a case, the Trickets versus Ox case, uh, in which um, a court had found that a change of practice at a, I believe they were an apple farm, um, constituted a nuisance. And so that, that the law was amended to, to address that as well. And it hasn't, it hasn't changed since then. What has happened is that there was a case last year uh, in which a superior court judge determined that farming practices at a, um, at a dairy farm in Addison um, constituted both a trespass and a nuisance, and the court held that the farm did not qualify for the right to farm because they could not show that they were in conformity with law and that there, and I think she also determined, the court determined that there had been significant changes. And then she had some, what was referred to as dicta, in which she said even if they hadn't qualified, that the plaintiffs would have been able to overcome the presumption that it was not a nuisance because there was a noxious interference with um, their use and enjoyment 
uh, significant obnoxious interference with their use and enjoyment of the neighboring property. Well, uh, so anyways, we're, <coughs> we're uh, trying to update our uh, right to farm bill and uh, we have uh, Bill Rell with us uh, to lead off the testimony this morning, um, who's spent quite a lot of time uh, working with some other farms as well as a professor from Wisconsin University of Wisconsin, I believe it is. Penn State University. Penn, in Penn State or and, Penn State? And the University of Arkansas. Okay. So you want to uh, lead off, Bill, with uh, where you folks are, and uh, sure. and uh, we'll go from there. Well, I guess I'd start by uh, Bill Rowell, for the record, dairy farmer from Franklin County. Uh, we milk 900 cows three times a day, and you'll notice that Vermont is under 600 dairy farms at this point. Uh, 572, I think it is. So a nuisance soup knocks more farms out of the picture. It discourages the next generation from wanting to have anything to do with farms when anybody can come along and throw a stone at you. Uh, so this is, this is quite important. Uh, how important is it? This country produced year ending 22 produced just shy of 227 billion pounds of milk. 18% of that milk was exported in the form of milk equivalent products like cheese powder and that sort of thing for a, for a total value of nine and a half billion dollars. That's three and a half percent of the gross domestic product for this country. And that's across this country, over three million jobs. So I know, I know the farm numbers are down, but agriculture really produces. And we're not just feeding this country, but we're feeding other countries as well. So to have some, some simple tool that would protect the farmer seems to me like it's a must. If we're, if we're interested in growing our own food in this country, if we're interested in having farms left in New England, Vermont produces two thirds of the milk produced in New England. So now is the time. I mean, we're getting close to where the time's gonna be behind us if we don't pay attention. So this is really quite, quite important. Um, The guy that we were talking with on the Zoom conference from Pennsylvania State University is an attorney. His name is Brooke Duar, D-U-E-R. He, uh, he teaches law. He was the chief, he was a staff counsel for Penn State University for six years. He's very familiar with uh, right to farm law because Penn State University has a national agriculture law center which works in conjunction with the national agriculture law center at the university of arkansas so rather than reinvent the wheel i thought it'd be kind of handy if we could pick his brain hmm. and and uh, he has some good ideas uh, the the one thing that he said and, and I, I think Michael Brady agrees with, with this, that he said short and simple is easier to get past than something that's voluminous. So um, Michael uh, has something that's, that, that fits that bill, so to speak. Uh, the thing that I was interested in was seeing that the right to farm law gets tied, the short and simple version, gets tied to the required agricultural practices. 
for, for this reason. For one, if it's tied to the RAPs, then the farm is following the RAPs and is in compliance. You can't go to the farm and say, we want to take you to court because of this or that or the other. If you're in compliance, they now need to go to the Agency of Agriculture or the Agency of Natural Resources, whichever the matter applies to, and, and have that discussion there before they come to the farm. The other thing that it does, in my opinion, I'm not an attorney, so my, my understanding is if, if it's tied to the RAPs, the farm is in compliance. Um, the agencies, agencies, not, not saying anyone in particular, but I've noticed over the years that agencies tend to want to, at times, exceed their authority granted by the legislature. So if, if, if everything is going according to the way it's written, they can't exceed their authority. They only have that granted to them by the legislative body. And I think that's where we want to keep it so we don't have uh, uh, a rogue secretary, so to speak, deciding they're going to do such and such. Now what do you do? You have no control over it. You're upside down. So my opinion, for what it's worth, short and simple, tie it to the RAPs and, and uh, have it granted by the legislative body. The authority. Um, then um, one issue that um, I think he raised uh, and you talked to it uh, a little bit earlier today was the uh, trespass issue. Yeah. And, um, he, I, I think it was his intentions, you should stay away from that particular issue if you can. Should I read this? Um, yeah, I mean. Okay, yeah. so, so uh, the attorney, Duar, uh, I've been after him uh, in, back and forth for the last three weeks, and I said, look, we're going to end up in, in front of Senate Ag, and there's going to be a discussion, and I, I want to, doesn't have to be exhaustive, but I'd, I'd like your opinion on the revised bill. And so finally, I got it last night. <laughs> and uh, here, here's what he said. He, he said, as I have said previously, if this bill were to pass as is, it would certainly be better for farmers than current Vermont law. And, and here's some notes on, under uh, 5751. It only refers to providing protection from nuisance suits, but the text of the bill also provides protections from trespass throughout. He said, I use parentheses here because the term trespass is really a generic word. It could be interpreted by a court in the future as including many and various different legal causes of action lawsuits. Those causes of action potentially included for protection could include a multitude of types of claims for money damages and other legal remedies. On the other hand, nuisance is a very specific legal term that includes only one legal cause of action, which can be characterized as either a private nuisance or a public nuisance. And the precise meaning of that term is not ambiguous. Then, 5752, he says, no comments, looks fine, serves the purpose intended. 5753, he had uh, three different bullet points. Uh, he said, this provides protection from both nuisance and trespass suits, and the flaws with that are addressed above, including trespass. Generically, would presumably draw immediate attention and the objection from the plaintiff's bar. The entire bill should be amended to say nuisance and trespass to property. If anything beyond nuisance is included within the protection grant. Next is page five, line one to two. For maximum protection of farmers, 
the tax and act and the activity was not a nuisance or trespass at the time the activity was initiated is not desirable including this text simply invites the plaintiff in a case to simply allege when it started it wasn't a problem but things have now gotten worse he said that's all a plaintiff would have to do to, to defeat any motion to dismiss a case the credibility of the plaintiff's testimony about whether things have gotten worse will always be made a question of fact for only a jury to decide. So by including this text, every case could easily be made to require a jury trial and the, and the accompanying expense. Next and last is page five, line eight through nine. For maximum protection of farmers, the text which excludes from protection a claim which results from the negligent operation of an agricultural activity. That just invites the plaintiff in the case to simply allege that the actions upon which the case is based were done negligently. That is all a plaintiff would have to do to defeat any motion to dismiss a case at any time. Perhaps ironically, alleging that the claim is based upon negligent acts may be helpful in invoking insurance coverage on any policy of liability insurance held by the farmer suit. Yeah. And Senator Starr has a copy of that, so he could yeah. distribute uh, copies to your committee. Yeah, say I'll have a copy of the Okay, good. Nope. Of the letter. Um, and uh, the um, I don't do you do have other witnesses uh, that wanted to uh, chime in at this point, Bill, or well, is Amanda joining us? Yes, uh, there's Amanda. Good morning, Amanda. Bobby, can I just ask Bob a quick Just a second, Amanda. Um, uh, Mr. Oak, do you know how many lawsuits, how many farms have been sued in the past decade? Yeah. Roughly. Very few. 100, 10? No, a, a small number, I believe. Uh, Michael, Michael would know. <laughs> It's hard to say. Okay. In the last decade, I would say probably mm -hmm. under 15. Okay. In the under, past year? Past year, I only know one. Okay. But see, when you say farms, you're not talking just dairy. You're talking everything. Right. Vegetables, okay. sheep, pork, goats. So you're saying dairy farms could be the number could be smaller. Any other questions? I wonder if we can get a copy of the Right to Farm statue. Is that yeah, Linda's getting You're on it? Okay. Yeah, that'd be that great. would be really helpful to have that side by side as we're talking. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think Mr. O'Grady is doing a side by side also for us on the before and after. So, right. what we're trying to do. Thank you. So, um, ready to go to Amanda? Nope. Good morning, everybody. My name is Amanda St. Pierre. Um, welcome, new new Senate um, Ag members. And uh, I currently am <clears throat> the executive director of Vermont Dairy Producer Alliance, which formed about seven years ago now. I think we might be <clears throat> losing my voice, so I pardon if I keep doing that. Um, uh, about seven years ago, and we um, are made up um, of dairy farms in all the counties, and um, certainly our businesses affect every county economically. Um, and uh, we we formed to represent dairies at a time when we didn't, um, we just didn't think that we had a presence in the state house, and we wanted to educate folks about what we were doing and the changes we were making and um the unique things that we bring to the table that other industries may not do so we are excited to be here today and we're excited to work with your committee on all things um related to dairy and ag and certainly the right to farm is a important issue to us um and uh i'll tell you a little bit about myself prior to getting into my testimony on this bill I currently farm with my husband, and as January 1st came around, we were excited to 
um, have our two sons join in the farm. So we're transitioning to the next generation. Um, this has been a couple of years in the making. Uh, I have a son who is going to be 28 in May, Jamie, and he's married um, to his wife, Ellie, and they um, are actively both on the farm today. She does run on the side. Her little side gig is running, um, but <clears throat> currently she is working on the farm as she awaits her first child. And then my son, Bradley, is also married, and he has uh, two children with one on the way, um, and he is uh, 26, and they both came back from college and joined our dairy operation. I say this because um, it is a matter of pride for us, so I, I'm using that a little bit, but there are a lot of dairies in the state that are looking to transition to the next generation. <clears throat> and some of what we're talking about in the right to farm offers some security to doing that. Um, our farm is located in Berkshire. We have around 100 employees and we are um, considered a large farm under the state permit. We're currently diversifying into um, taking our methane digester and instead of making electricity, we're looking to make renewable natural gas. And I'm saying that again, because I think the right to farm is another key component of farms diversifying into that field. Um, so at this point, the testimony on this bill is we have been looking at this for several years and researching and looking at other states and talking to other farmers and other dairy associations and just trying to see what would make sense to really update a, a right to farm bill that we already have. And that's kind of how the conversation began. We're not looking for the Cadillac. We're not looking for the strongest language like Oregon. You know, really the ask is simple. We would like it updated um, we are required in the state to follow certain guidelines, and we do not feel at this point that even by um, implementing those guidelines and following state statute, that we are offered the protections that we need. And I wanted to just talk a little bit about, um, as our industry, and I just looked it up, um, in 2020, Vermont generated $0.7 billion dollars in ag cash receipts and the highest value commodity of that was dairy. Um, and again, this was back in 2020. So, you know, 2020 was a time of great change with COVID. I, I bring that to the forefront because dairy continues and has been a player in our state economically. We're a driver and we bring in money that comes from outside the state, invest it in state businesses. And to do that and not get minimal protection under the law is concerning. We're investing every day. We've been investing every day since my husband and I began farming in 1986. <clears throat> and we have practices that we have to invest in. And I, I did hear um, Michael Grady when he spoke last about um, the investment into manure storage, um, you know, ponds basically and into storm wander ponds into silage leachate ponds and into digesters franklin county <clears throat> has the highest number of digesters in the state in the county and all of these things took great investment and it could be someone could say the smell from there is noxious they'd have to prove that in the court but it would just be good to have something that could say that they did this in accordance with the law. And that's really what we're asking. And I think a lot of, um, one reason you don't see a lot of lawsuits up to this point is because we try to work with our neighbors. We work really hard with our neighbors. We communicate with them. We're sending out newsletters to them, keeping them updated on what we're doing. We have, uh, if they have a complaint, we try to address it. You know, there's a lot of work done to avoid these types of things. But in the case where you just can't resolve it, um, it would be, it would serve us to have this right to farm bill updated. And we talk about diversity and I, I wanna bring up this gas project because I think you're gonna see more farms coming in that have digesters. Um, one of the benefits to 
having a digester is that it created an economic revenue. Um, it was using something our cows do every day, which is produce manure. And it captures the methane and stops it from going up into the ozone. And then it creates electricity, which we were able to sell. Markets have developed in the last 20 years, 10 years, five years aggressively to offer our dairy farms an interesting place to be because a lot of us have digesters currently and those that don't could maybe join together and, and build a digester, but it gives us another market that we can um, you know, kind of meet our goals on the carbon side, but still get an economic revenue. So it involves infrastructure, right? We have to build, we have to do different things and it would be nice to be covered under the law um, if someone didn't like particularly like, you know, um, you know, the way the the silo, the digester looked or 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 anything to that effect. Or again, um, manure has a smell. The digester kills a lot of the pathogens that cause the smell. But when you land apply and you're manure injecting, you could smell it still. And so those are all concerns, right? They're all concerned that somebody isn't going to understand what we're doing and um and and you know take it past the point of like compromise or or discussion. So as we get more involved in um diversifying our dairies, and I say dairies because I'm a dairy farmer, but again, this right to farm covers. And last year we heard testimony from Christmas tree farmers who they have a very short window selling their Christmas trees. And the parking has become, you know, you know, people who moved in don't like the cars parked there when they're going to get Christmas trees. And we heard berry farmers, you know, we've heard um, from sheep farmers, and this affects really all of us, this right to farm coverage. Um, so we are here today to just offer information of the types of practices that we currently do, that we're looking to do in the future in hopes that, um, you can ask questions and, and get to better understand the direction we're taking this, but also why a protection um, like this could be helpful to be updated. And uh, again, we're following state statute. We're not asking for protection if we're not under the required ag practices or we're doing something that's not, um, you know, not under the regulations. We're asking for protection from doing things that we're regulated to do. And I'll open it up to, to any questions that you guys may have. Yeah. Uh, and have you folks, uh, because you have several farms, right? And, and have you ever been um, bothered with any of these uh, uh, nuisance suits, Amanda, or uh, where you felt that, you know, or have you not been bothered? Because Franklin County is a big uh, agricultural county, so uh, maybe it's not, uh, you folks aren't bothered as much or? Well, um, so interesting, interesting. Yes, we have um, farms kind of scattered throughout the county, different land bases, if you will. And I think, you know, Franklin County, and I don't have the right statistic, <clears throat> a lot of the land we farm has been land trusted. So it is required to be used for ag purposes. So, you know, um, there's manure being spread on the fields, um, we're cultivating, we're growing corn, we're doing that kind of thing. In the last two years, the um, the demographics and the people who have moved into the area is a very different mix of people. Welcome everybody. But I'm not sure that they're used to dairy farming or farming activities on land that the state has invested to keep open. So this is the concern, Senator, is that as we're using this designated land for the purpose it's designated for, is there going to be an issue? Are we protected? Um, currently, no, we have been able to work with neighbors who have had concerns. Um, we have been able to work with agencies. If a, if a neighbor has had a concern and the agency has come out, the agencies have, you know, tried to work with that neighbor and explain 
they have a buffer, they're applying it correctly, but there's always the chance. There's always a chance that someone has deep pockets and is willing to pursue this. And it would be a, just a source of, um, you know, just a source of comfort for my two sons and their wives who will be taking over this dairy, dairy business that they'll be able to farm and farm within the law. Yeah, yeah we're certainly getting um, a lot of, a lot of folks are, are moving north uh, uh, to our state and they certainly are coming from, you know, a lot of different places and different backgrounds and and not accustomed to our local people and the way they react to, uh, you know, their neighbors and things. So I, I certainly get your point. Are there are other questions, uh, Brian? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So Amanda, uh, thanks for coming this morning. It's good to see you again. And I, I'm sympathetic with your view about the uh, digester. How much is a digester? Well, <clears throat> back when we put it, put it in, it was in 2006, and it was around 2.1 total investment into the digester. Now that was 2006. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, they're they're expensive. It's not it's not cheap, and it's not cheap to run. It's not cheap to maintain, and a lot of our digesters were put in around the same time. So we're looking at some huge investments to upgrade, um, and so I really feel farms are probably going to look to the same route we're looking to because it it helps flow those upgrades and it, and there's opportunity there. Um, so yeah, they're 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 very expensive. I think the one that they're putting in um, this time um, is going to be over ten ten million dollars. Yeah. So as I say, I, I if I were a farmer before I could make that investment, I would feel much better knowing that there was some legal protection behind it. So I get what you're saying for sure. Yeah. Are there any, uh, Brian? Uh, thanks, this is really helpful testimony, uh, and it's good to see you. Uh, so this might be something that we'll get from Ledge Council when we get the side-by-side, -side, but do you have a sense of what will be protected under the new law that wouldn't be protected right now in terms of actions and activities on a farm? So I, I think my interpretation, and I'm not an attorney, yeah. but my yeah. hope totally is that we're going to be protected for the practices that we're required to do currently under state statute. I mean, that is a hope for me. It's very concerning, very concerning. And, and keep in mind, we started work on this before the Volsterfeld trial even happened. And last year, you know, as we were talking about this, it really had no involvement in what was going on with their farm. But since then, the ruling has come out and it really shows, shows holes in our current um, current right to farm, where we can't be offered protection for what we're being asked to do and what we're being asked to spend considerable amount of money for. I think there's a misconception that our practices are financed by the Agency of Ag or NRCS or FSA. There is money available, but most of the time it pays maybe 20%, 10% of what they're asking us to do. Never has it paid 100% of the investment um, that we're asked to do. And, and sometimes, to be quite frank, in order to get that practice implemented quickly, the farmer has to pay for it directly because there could be a three to five year wait to get this practice in place. Thank you. Well, and just, just for the committee's uh, uh, knowledge, um, we did a little cost analysis uh, this summer, the task force on mm -hmm. uh, what it costs a Vermont farm to operate compared to our neighbors, mm -hmm. uh, New Hampshire, Mass, uh, Maine. New York, uh, Maine was a, another one. But it, it costs our farmers, uh, what's projected and in, in estimated to be a dollar in 76 cents, I think it is, a hundred weight. 
more to produce milk in Vermont than it does, uh, say, in New York or Mass or New Hampshire to meet these, like, RAPs and, and all the different regulations, uh, which Amanda just alluded to, um, they get some help toward meeting the uh, different regs, but the bulk of it's borne by, you know, the farmer. And so, uh, you know, there are some facts to back up, uh, uh, you know, these uh, things, so. And it, is it, are you saying, Senator, it's more expensive because we have more regulation than the other states in part? Well, a lot of that was due to the, the, you know, the lawsuit that, that was brought against the, the state for water uh, pollution and, and but okay. Uh, okay. nobody, I don't think, okay. had ever done a real cost analysis of what it does cost to meet those uh, requirements. That, and um, not saying that those are bad, but, uh, you know, it's a rule in the law that we follow uh, the RAPs. And the RAPs, when we put this together many years ago, weren't really in place, I don't believe. Um, so things have happened uh, to try to make our farms more sustainable and for the long haul. Uh, that's caused some of this to, and some people to want to revise our right to farm laws. Uh, oh, uh, yes, sir. Thank you, Senator. Uh, just for the record, Caroline Gordon with Blue Vermont. Um, also very sympathetic to all the issues raised this morning um, and hearing from Amanda, um, definitely support that amending right to farm to uh, cover also farm diversification, succession planning, I also want to underscore currently no beginning farmer, no new farmer moving to Vermont, putting up shop on good agricultural soils next to a neighbor that has been there before is protected from nuisance lawsuits currently. Yeah. So um, the amendment, I'm, I'm looking forward to study it more, but if we can change it all together so that any, any type of farming that is regulated under the RIPs and that is covered with the new amended practices that are now included can be protected no matter when they started business. Um, that, that's, I think, one step towards incentivizing farming in the state, even though it doesn't solve any of the under underlying related issues like affordability of farmland or so on and so forth. Uh, other questions for Bill or Amanda at this point? Well, that was the premise of the whole thing, was to be all-inclusive inclusive. as far as farms. It doesn't matter if you're growing, it doesn't matter what you're doing. If you're a farmer, you're a farmer. You're yeah. included. It's very good. Yeah. I, 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 would, I would say uh, the, the Act 248 permit process that we had to go through for the digester, that's a fairly exhaustive process, mm -hmm. and, and it's a... It's a worthwhile thing to do. We had to do it twice because we started with one big engine and then we put in a second one. So we had to go through the process again, which seemed foolish, but we went through it twice. But uh, you know, it, if you do that, it indemnifies you to some extent because you've already passed the test, so to speak. Yeah. And our digester cost us $2.75 million. But the reason that had to something to do with it was we had to build 3.2 miles of three-phase three infrastructure. Mm -hmm. yeah. That was $256,000 out of our pocket for something we never owned. Yeah. So, but the idea of working with people that don't understand what your practice is, I, I'll, I'll speak to that for just a second. Over the, over the past, we'll call it 12 years, 12, 13 years, we've hosted tours for over 33,000 people from wow. 48 <clears throat> countries, if you include the U.S., 48 <laughs> countries. And 
the, the most common thing that you hear as you go through and show people this, 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 the, the animals, their, their housing, their feed, how they're handled, you try to do it all in an open, transparent manner. And when you show them something, the most common thing is they say, well, I didn't realize it worked that way. <laughs> no, but you had an opinion anyway. See, that's the problem. Yeah. And, and the opinion has to have a factual base if it's going to be legitimate. So the idea was my brother would say, why are we doing this again? <laughs> and because we had a lot of people coming at us. But I think it makes a difference. And I think it was worthwhile. People want to know. They, they, they want to know. So if you've got something like that, share it with them. You give them an idea. So. <clears throat> Were a lot of these people neighbors and people from all over the world, like yeah. you said. It's yeah. incredible. I yeah. mean, I, I'm, my picture is on the uh, Ag Hall of Fame wall. Oh, really? And my picture includes four guys from Turkmenistan. Wow. Wow. They came to this country because they were trying to understand modern agricultural practices and with the idea that they need to better feed their people, more reliably uh, feed their people. So when you're working with that audience, it's a different conversation. People that are challenged for food uh, or, or, or the, the system's fragile, they're more respectful of it. They, they don't have the attitude that we have in this country. You know, oh, well, I don't want it in that size packaging. I want something else. And it's too expensive. Mm -hmm. See? And those folks appreciate nutrition. And, and it's quite the different conversation. Yeah. But anyway, that's, <coughs> I guess that's all I have to uh, say. <coughs> any other questions for Amanda? No. Right now? No. Uh, Joe, or are you with us, Joe? Joe's the president of the Farm Bureau. So, you know, if he's on. I am. Yeah, good morning, Joe. I understand you've been away. Yes, I just came back from uh, the uh, American Farm Bureau annual convention in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Uh, but my car broke down, so I'm having trouble getting back to Vermont. But hopefully by Monday, we'll be back and I'll be in to see you guys. Um, so, yeah. so Senator Starr, thank you very much for having me on. So um, I, uh, Joe Tisbert from Valley Dream Farm, an organic produce farm in Cambridge, Vermont. We are a small farm. Um, we are also uh, working on a transition plan for my daughter to, to take over the farm. Um, she'd like it quicker than I would like it, but that's... Uh, you know, you got a lot of energy and a lot of great ideas. So, um, you know, speaking to the right to farm, not only is not only is for dairy and as a Farm Bureau president, we support all levels of farms where we want to support the largest dairy to the smallest far vegetable farm or beef farm. You know, we need we need this. We need an upgraded right to farm bill. Um, just a few years ago, uh, bull that got loose went to criminal court. You know, we we are if you follow the state's uh, future of agriculture, and you want, and they want a lot of smaller farms, and they want a lot of this. Well, you know, the smaller farms are not as efficient as the bigger farms. They may have a broken fence that they don't see right away, or they may not be able to cover something. And if a, an animal gets out similar to that bull and they get criminally processed, you just throw, you just throw it a knife into that whole, a bunch of people who would be farming at some level. Um, so, you know, this is really important across the board. You know, the, a lot of the farms uh, that we work with, um, you know, need programs just like anybody else in order to survive. We also need uh, to, to know that our backs are, 
when we're following the right processes, uh, we should be, we should have, the state should have our back. And right now, I don't believe it does so. Um, if you look at the nuisance laws and you look at getting sued, criminally sued over a tragic accident. Um, so my, uh, from our, from my point of view as a small farmer, we need as much protection as everybody else. I have people walking onto my farm all the time. Uh, my door is open. If you want to walk on my farm, I live in the most beautiful place in America. And if you want to walk on my farm, it's, I, I allow that. But on the same token, I don't want you coming back at me and saying, well, I think you sprayed something over there or you did some of this and you're organic and you're, I mean, we get this all the time. So to strengthen this law would be good. So I spent uh, a majority of, uh, I spent a lot of time uh, talking with my brethren, my 50 other brethren of presidents of Vermont Farm Bureau. <clears throat> And I'm going to tell you that the right to farm laws are very are all over the place, and most states have a lot stronger right to farm than we do. And one of the things that came to me most uh, was uh, actually our neighbor in Massachusetts. And I said, "How are you guys handling this? You have a lot more folks and a lot less farms." And they said. You know, basically, if you're following the best farm practices, then you're covered. And we exhausted the RAPs, and a lot of us, and a lot of us talked against it, and a lot of us talked for it. Um, we came up with a good plan. And if you look at all the farms in the state, there's so many great climate practices being done on the farms. And if we eliminate that and we build more housing, are we what are we doing? Um, but the, my point being is that if you're following the RAPs, if you're following uh, the laws, then why should you be able to be ha harassed and, and farmed and, and, um, and prosecuted or try to be prosecuted and taken to court, spending money? You shouldn't be able to do it. That's why you guys did a great job in setting up the RAPs and the best farm practices and they're all listed across the state. We need to protect our farms and we need to protect our industry, yeah. not only for that little farm, but for the bigger farms and the medium farms and all farms. Yeah, uh, thank you, Joe, uh, Brian. Thanks, Joe, good to see you. I'm just curious, I mean, period, you know, in every profession, every business, sometimes there are bad actors. So I'm wondering what kind of protection should an adjacent landowner actually have? What kind of, you're not telling everyone you have no protections at all. So I'm just wondering what kinds of protections should be in place for adjacent landowners? Um, well, from my point of view, if I'm following the, the uh, practices, then I should be protected. Um, you know, with these these uh, local landowners, I mean, I know from our point of view, we work with all our neighbors. I think most farms in the state work from all our neighbors. If you're not following the practices, then the yeah. neighbor should have the right. If you don't follow the practices that are in place, then there should be some there. There should be something that protects the neighbor. But I don't know a lot of farms that are not doing, sure. I don't know any farms that off the top of my head that are not following the RAPs, that are not doing the practices. Even if they're a small uh, dairy herd or vegetable grower, there's still rules that you have to follow and, and you know, setbacks and, and uh, all kinds of things that we need to protect our neighbors. So um, I think I think the first step is always to talk with your neighbor. And I think Amanda said that really well. Um, and we do that all the time. We work with our neighbors all the time. Uh, most farms have to, uh, a lot of times our neighbors want us to help them out by you, by maybe using a piece of their ground, uh, to, to make it worthwhile and worth and, and working. So Michael Grady, Council. Yeah. so is that accurate that if, if a neighbor, if a farm is not following then RAPs, the adjacent landowner does have the possibility then to sue under the new draft? Um, under the new draft? Yeah. Potentially. 
potentially, but not definitely. One thing we all have to remember is these cases are fact-based cases. Yeah. So to say that it's always going to be there or never going to be there, it's, it's hard because it depends on the facts. Okay. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Uh, um, I'd like to clarify that I have not seen the new adjusted rules um, from Brian, uh, from Mr. Grady, and I'd love it if we could get a copy. Yeah, um, we're um, we're going to be holding, uh, you know, at, at least uh, a couple more hearings in regards to uh, the draft. It's only a draft at this point, and uh, so we've got, um, you know, we've got a place for it, um, you know, saved out, but. Uh, this is something that uh, you know I intend. I intend the committee to rush through. Um, we, you know, because it'll be another ten or fifteen years probably before it gets changed again. And so we we want to do it right, uh, you know, as right as we can. Um, so we're, uh, you know, we're gonna spend some time putting the, you know, the new draft uh, together. Um, um, the new draft is on the website. It is. Yeah. Yeah. We just got it. Yeah. And it's this on the website also. Print. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Joe, you could go to our uh, website and pick what we have in print up uh, from our website, if, if that's of interest to you. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Appreciate that. Yeah. You know, we have to look at, you know, how are farms protecting themselves today? I mean, I mean, you know, um, not only uh, financially, if you look at um, the water quality issue and the climate issue, the farms are, are so important to the solutions that, you know, the harder we make it for farmers to go forward, the less farmers we have. And, and I think we need to protect all farmers. Yeah, uh, no questions, no further questions for Joe. Thank you. So, um, welcome. And you're you're new to this, I think. I am very new to this. If I just slide around yeah. right over your dollar, I'm not sure. No, I'm fine. You good? I'm fine. So, my name's Tucker Purchas. I own and operate Fairmont Farm here in East Montpelier. Thank you guys for the opportunity to come and introduce myself. Um, so I, I farm with my aunt and uncle and my two cousins. Um, so there's five of us that currently own the business. We milk a thousand cows in East Montpelier, 450 cows in Craftsbury. Um, we crop 3,800 acres in 13 towns. Um, <laughs> yes, so we're very out. spread out. We've got a lot of things going on. Um, so I've been involved. I'm, I'm not actually from a farm family. Um, started working um, at at Fairmont when I was a young kid, um, went on to New York to college. I graduated from Cornell um, and then I was out in California for a little while and at that time there was five owners on the farm. One, uh, Two of the owners decided to leave. That gave me an opportunity to come back um, as a manager and then in 2005 we bought out um, one of the senior partners. In 2007 we bought out two more senior partners. So. Um, just a short period of time there in five years, there was a lot of evolution of ownership um, and movement. Uh, we also bought the farm in Craftsbury, um, and I lived up in Craftsbury for about nine years. Um, my wife is not from a farm at all. She, we actually uh, went to high school together. She was living down in Washington, D.C., moved back to Craftsbury, um, and now I think she shares the same passion for agriculture and, and uh, and community as I do. Um, so she worked at uh, Hyde Park Elementary um, for uh, for quite a while. Um, we lived there. Now she works at East Montpelier Elementary. She also helps run our market that we just started um, and run our summer camps. Um, so we do a, a lot of different things there on the farm. Um, I've got two girls, nine and six, um, that uh, we actually live at the old Lyle Avon farm. Great opportunity. Some of the opportunities on these larger dairies aren't great for kids just because we've got so much going on. This farm uh, gives us the opportunity. We have sheep, we have pig, we have calves, and those kids, um, 
I work 12 days and take two days off. So if you ask my kids on the weekend what they want to do, they're probably going to say make cinnamon rolls first. But the second, they're going to say they want to work with dad. You know, and they want to go to the cat barn. They want to cow out cows and name calves and ride in the mower. Um, so anyway, that's a brief history of me and 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 what I'm all about. Um, I think I think in my 20 years here on the farm, we've seen enormous change on the farm. And, and I think that's important because I think, you know, dairy's always evolving. And, and, and I think even going going ahead, it's gonna evolve differently. Um, so um, from 2005 till now, I think we added on to the barns or built barns 10 different times. We built four manure pits, um, you know, our equipment changed, our crops changed, our you know equipment, I used to use a 3,500 gallon spreader, now I got 72s and, and uh, so a lot of things has, has changed. Um, when the pandemic hit, um, it, it changed a lot of things from milk price coming down um, and it really, you know, in agriculture, I think we needed, we learned that we needed to be flexible and creative and we saw an opportunity um, to start what we call Fairmont Market. Um, so it's, it's uh, we thought there was an opportunity to provide local meat and food to, um, you know, our local community. They could come in and buy either online or, or, or come into the market in a safe environment. So um, we now have our own pork, our own beef, and our own lamb. Um, and then we sell all sorts of Cabot products. We, I skipped over, we ship about 130,000 pounds of milk to Cabot every day. They turn that into about 12,000 pounds of cheese, depending on if your daily intake is an ounce of cheese or two ounces of cheese a day. Um, we probably feed close to 100,000 people every day from our farms. Uh, so we sell Cabot products there. We sell local honey, local maple syrup. Um, and uh, we have coffee anyway. We sell lots of local products there. Um, and that and that is a one way of diversifying that we've done. We also plant Christmas trees. We raise our own beef and sell that elsewhere. You know, we've done a lot of things to diversify, but we couldn't do it without, um, I say we have five owners. Um, the five owners have, uh, we have seven kids among us. And um, my cousins, um, husband and wife and my wife are greatly involved in the business, um, running the market. Um, we have uh, some commercial cows that we sell and then we have some registered cows that we sell. They're very involved in all those things. Um, so we're very focused on water quality um, and changing our cropping practices. Those have changed a lot. And in 20 years, um, we're currently planting winter rye on all our corn ground, so about 1,600 acres of corn ground. Um, some of the newest practices that we've uh, that we've started doing is is, uh, is uh, a manure injection. So we're running two manure injectors. Um, so we have uh, you know we don't worry about any runoff or soil erosion. Um, we can do a single application of. Uh, more manure um, and and uh, utilize all the nitrogen in that manure, um, so use less uh, less commercial nitrogen. Um, yeah, have you have you noticed a drop in commercial fertilizer since you've been using the injectors? We have yes, for multiple reasons though. For one, for the cost of nitrogen um, has just has just come up a lot and. Um, you know, so we're putting all the manure in there and we're capturing all the nitrogen. In the past, when you used to broadcast, if you weren't working it in, you'd lose a lot of that nitrogen. Um, so, um, so we're using a lot less nitrogen on on our cornland. We actually didn't top dress any of our cornland last year with nitrogen, yeah. um, which is the first time we've ever done that. Now, I, um, I don't know if the committee knows uh, how much do those injectors cost, those manure injectors. So um, uh, probably about thirty-five thousand dollars for a manure injector, and then we have um, a flow meter put on it, and so we're, and then we've got what's called ag leader. So we're mapping every field, so you can pull up a map of a field, and it'll tell you exactly how many gallons were applied to exactly every part of that field, um, and 
those go into our manure records. It can show, you know, our setbacks from, you know, a pond, a lake, a well, and exactly how much was applied. Um, and, and we have, you know, from our nutrient management uh, plan, we have, um, you know, an amount we're supposed to apply in the spring and a amount we're supposed to apply in the fall. And uh, then you go look at exactly what we did and it's mapped out and it's 7,102 gallons on that. You know, it's, 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 it's very exact. Um, so the flow meter and the ag meter software is about another $15,000. How many? Um, about $15,000 for that technology. Um, and that's something, um, you know, it's really hard to find good operators. And, and 20 years ago, we weren't keeping track of any manure records. And now we're keeping track of, you know, handheld records. And there's just room for error. So when you go ahead to this, uh, you know, field mapping stuff, um, there's no room for error, really. Um, you know, it's, 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 it is what it is. Um, and so we made an investment to do that. And, 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 and I mean, we're proud of, uh, we're proud that, you know, we've done that. I think a lot of these farms also have, but um, we know we're highly regulated, um, you know, and we accept, you know, that we're highly regulated. We accept the regulations, you know, for the betterment of our farm um, and Vermont itself. Um, but, um, so when my first daughter, you know, was born, um, you know, I've always wondered if there's gonna be an opportunity for her to return to the farm ever, or 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 my cousin's kids, um, we're very we're super involved in youth. My aunt and uncle run a 4-H group for years, and so between the 4-H group, we're bringing kids in, and then our summer camp. Summer camps, we've got 125 kids that we bring in for five different weeks. We get, I'm sorry, 25 kids each week, and they come in and they learn about agriculture. And we got kids coming out of Massachusetts. We got kids coming out of. I, you know, you know, Vermont, lots of local kids, lots of return kids that just love it. Um, but we teach a lot of agriculture uh, and teach these new people that are moving into our towns what it is to be on a farm. They see our equipment, they see our cows, they see our manure, they get to take care of an animal. And I think that goes a long way. The 4-H group is really super impressive, I think. Um, so right now, if I think about it, we have five kids at Cornell University studying agriculture and dairy. Four of them, well, five of them were in our 4-H group. They all grew up in East Montpelier. One of them is from a farm. Four kids are not. And I think that's one of the reasons that, that this farm bill is really important to get these young people a spot to be here, whether they're on farm or just working in agriculture to support all the reasons we live here, all the reasons that people move here for open lands, for you know, water quality for great products coming out of this area. Um, so if uh, if you ever visit my farm, you'll see everybody is wearing uh, a Fairmont shirt in the back. Um, our motto is farming for future generations, and that really is our motto. And, 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 and I think that's why, you know, these bills are so important that we have um, a spot for those young kids to come back to and continue to produce the milk um, that we do here in Vermont. Um, all the changes I talked about um, in the last 20 years, I think going ahead, we've got a lot of different changes coming in my mind. Um, Agamark, we shipped to Agamark. They have a base program, so I can only make up to so much milk. Um, and looking forward, you know, I used to be able to just build a barn and grow cows, and that's how I grew my business. Um, now looking forward, I think it's gonna be more diversification um, and to bring in some of these young people, we're going to have to continue to grow our business and we're going to have to do it differently. And I think that's something that's different. You know, you ask how many people or how many firms um, have had have had lawsuits. Well, we've grown the same way for a long time. Looking forward, the next five or 10 years, we're going to grow differently. So we're going to grow differently and we're going to grow with different people in our communities. So um, I don't know if the past, you know, lawsuits is really a good thing, but things will happen differently. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons um, to, you know, that I'm here advocating to update this um, older bill. Um, yeah. And uh, last, you know, um, thank you guys for giving me the opportunity. Fireman of a thousand cows, 10 minutes away. Um, you guys are all more than welcome to come as a committee and visit, to come individually, to bring your families, bring your colleagues. 
um, I can I can forward along my information and uh, I I I, uh, I tend to ramble when I'm passionate about stuff. And if you think this is rambling, <laughs> wait till you come to the farm. Um, I uh, I hope you have some time, and I'd love to I love to give you guys a tour. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, well, thank you, uh, Tucker. Uh, very interesting. Yep. Uh, Brian? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, Tucker, I like to think that I don't spend a lot of time in a chair watching game shows all day, but I'm not sure I could follow you around all day. Uh, <laughs> like you're, you're moving at the speed of light here, and <laughs> even just having you sit here, I can tell that you just want to get this thing done and then get to the next thing. And uh, so thank you very much for that. That was really, really impressive. I'll uh, slow down. <laughs> no, you don't need to do that either. Yeah, and to have that uh, succession in mind already is really important too. And uh, yeah. well, we're 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 a little bit different. So uh, my aunt and uncle are about 13 years older than I am, and I grew up um, in a single family home, and they pretty much took me under their wing as a as a young kid, and they brought me and showed me colleges, and they got me into agriculture and. and uh, um, you know, I spent some time away in California, but I, I had the opportunity to come back, and that was always my dream, to be honest with you. But then my cousins are about 13 years younger than me. So we're, you know, we don't have this big generation gap, um, but then we've got seven kids. We actually, um, my cousin um, is pregnant, so we've got an eighth, eighth kid coming, but we have seven <laughs> kids coming from nine to two currently, um, and they're all involved and super excited yeah, that's about it. Great. Yeah. Uh, Brian? Thanks. With my other hat on, I chair Senate Education in the afternoon. Okay. I just wonder a couple things. First of all, I think it's our committee, without a doubt, is interested in getting young kids in schools involved in things like 4-H and, and, and how we incorporate that into you know the school curriculum a little bit more. But in that, maybe we can have an email conversation. Yeah. About. The other thing that we've been talking a lot about is school meals and getting local farmers, you know, to help supply the food to school meals. Yep. Is are you in that supply chain at all with schools? So or or, or colleagues or just trying to get a sense of that if, if you supply any of the schools. So the, uh, the short answer is no. Okay. Um, so we've done we've done um, some fundraising. Yeah. Um, so we did a live nativity for two nights here in East Montpelier. We had about uh, four or five hundred people attend. Yeah. I um, mean, we've done that two years in a row, um, and we match every donation. That's a free event. We match every donation, um, and then um, we matched it actually with products out of our market, um, and then we brought that to the school, and the school distributed that to ten families that oh, they chose. Yeah. They chose. Yeah. So um, unfortunately, this past year, um, I, I'm not sure why the donations weren't weren't what we had expected. Um, you know, we don't want to hold this event and and, and be asking people for money. Um, uh, but the year before, we did it and we had fifteen hundred dollars worth of donations, and then we supplied fifteen hundred dollars. So we gave ten families. Three hundred dollars worth of product out of our market. Yeah. Um, you know, half the donations yeah. and half what we match. But as far as in the school school lunch programs, um, I was no. just curious. Yeah, we're just trying to find: are there bottlenecks? Do, do people need help getting into the schools? That kind of thing. For some farms, I also would get that some farms are going to be more interested than others. So yeah, yeah, just curious. Okay, yeah. great. Um, Thank you. You know, we we supply a lot of the, uh, the concessions for soccer with their burger and meat and yeah. stuff like that. They're selling, but. Um, as far as in school yeah. launches, no, uh, we're less than we're less than like half a mile from the school. We have tours every week hmm. during the good weather. So the kids do come in. They from walk the school to school. And they, yeah, 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 yeah. They walk they, from the school to the farm, yeah. and uh, we usually That's do a good. tour about forty-five minutes, and then we have probably one of the most beautiful places in in central Vermont. Um, you just climb up on top of the hill. You can oversee the farm. You can look. 365 degrees around, just amazing. Dude, they go up there, they eat lunch uh, at, our, at our lunch spot, our yeah. tables with volleyball and all that stuff. And, and then they come back down, and they do one more quick tour, and then they go back to the front. Uh, I'm back to the school. Yeah. Thank you. You have uh, some relatives down down south too, right? Down the so, uh, so Richard, my uncle, so my mother's sister, Mary Richard, um, so his sister 
farm down in Bradford. Yeah. Yes. They, Margaret Walt Yes. They they do a good job for uh, the public and. Yeah. They do a great job on the public. They do a great job on the dairy, and they diversified a long time ago into pumpkins. Um, you know, and 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 that's another thing. It's it's it, it's different farming than what we're used to, um, and it and it presents its own challenges. I think. Yeah. As well. uh, operating in thirteen different towns, you must run into quite a few neighbors. Uh, yeah. So we crop thirty eight hundred acres, and I think we own about a third of that land. So we rent the rest of the land. So we rent a lot of land. Um, and and uh, we run into a lot of different neighbors. We run into a lot of new neighbors, um, a lot of diverse neighbors. You know, if you go up into Craftsburg, you've got a very diverse group of people living up there um, or vacationing up there. Um, Is that where you live? So I currently live here in East Mount Village. Yeah. So um, who's your family in Craftsbury? Um, so we actually don't. I lived up there for nine years, yeah. and we bought Randy and Louise Calderwood's farm. Sure, sure. So right there on South Albany Road. Yeah. My um, family is on Uri Road. Oh, sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So we Check use yeah. uh, like Bruce Uri's land, yeah. um, Alan Young's land, yeah. all all the creek roads. So we use a lot of land. We have, we have about 800 acres we use up there, uh, but it's a very diverse group. It's you know, you know it's some, <laughs> changed uh, a lot. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's changed a lot, and that. That was a super inviting town to move to um, when I moved there in 2005, and and I miss Crossford actually. It's a it's a, yeah, it's, it's a yeah. great community. Yeah, I lived up there for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a great community. It's a great spot. Yeah. But. So, other questions for Tucker? Well, thank you guys very much. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I look forward to working with you, and um, I definitely take me out if you ever want. Come yeah, great to the that's a yeah. great offer. Right. Where's your uh, you have a farm store or yep so right at uh, right at my house where i live is yep. uh lyle haven road and it used to be used to be uh, lyle haven uh, a farm and uh jerry rapaport from yep. boston on that it was kind of an investment farm and we had been using all the land and cropping all the land um, and when he decided to sell it um it was in 2014 and it was a very good year in the dairy industry and we decided to buy that um, farm and we thought we would make go of milking 60 registered cows there and sell some registered genetics um, since 2014 um, the dairy industry has been tough and we realized milking 60 registered cows there was not going to work um, so we now raise some heifers and dry cows and pigs and some sheep and we actually have turned the whole front office and milk house into a farm store with a full kitchen. Yeah. Um, and we do lots of community events on Friday night. We might, you know, cook something up and have people come in and try it. We uh, do a recipe bag every month, you know, so people can buy four recipes and we pack a bag with sixty-five dollars worth of stuff. And you know, with those recipes, they can, you know, make make different meals for themselves. But um, yeah, it's right there at Lyle Haven Road. Yeah. yeah. Um, and we're not always open. We've got a big online following. If you go to FairmontFarming.com, you get right to the market pretty quick, and then and then uh, you'll see you'll see a lot of what we do. Um, our our website is a lot about us, um, a lot about our farming practices, our animals, our locations, and then our market. And and, and uh, I think it's FairmontFarming.com. Yeah, well, if there are no other questions, uh, thanks for your time. Yeah, thanks, Tucker. Uh, yes, thank you guys. Thank you. <laughs> yes, some energy this day. Yeah, I know. Pumped us up. <laughs> he, he'll give him 40 years, he'll slow down. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're still energetic. Well, uh, <laughs> Don't cut yourself short. <laughs> Okay, well, um, <laughs> Steve, did you or Laura come to testify on this? Yes, Senator Starr, if, you, if you'd like us to. Yeah. Sure. No, I. Yeah. No, we have no one in the bathroom here. Excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> we'll we'll take a break in fifteen minutes so we can get through uh, the agency and. We still haven't had Michael up yet to go through the draft, but uh, good morning. Welcome. Good morning.
Good morning, Senator Starr, and thank you. Good morning to everyone. Uh, Steve Collier from the Agency of Agriculture. I'm the general counsel there. So every time I talk with farmers, I realize how much better they are at everything, including public speaking. <laughs> so, so they've already all said what I came to say in a much more effective way. But I, I, I'd like to just focus on the law for a second, if I might, because I, I, and I, I plan to talk more about what's problematic about the current law than instead about how we should move forward, because I think that's the impetus for the change, is the purpose, am I, in our judgment, the purpose of the current right to farm statute is all exactly as it should be. It's designed to protect farms. It's designed to allow farms to diversify and change their practices. The way the statute is worded, the implementation of it, is not in any way aligned with the purpose. It's porous. It's riddled with holes. When you look at the protection, it's a plaintiff's attorney's dream, in my opinion. And what I mean by that is when I look at litigation, and I want to start by saying whenever you're involved in litigation, you're losing. Whether you win or you whether you win at the end or you lose at the end, the cost of litigation itself is really extensive. And that's why I think the statute is so flawed, because if you look at what the statute requires, there's four different factual questions that are in the current statute. One is, are you meeting, are you conforming with all the laws? Okay, that creates factual, factual questions. The other is, are you using good agricultural practices? Again, factual questions. The other is, were you there first? Again, factual questions. The other is, are you have you changed anything significantly? Again, factual questions. The reason that matters is when you get into a court, the court can't decide factual questions until a trial, which is either by a, tr a judge or a jury. Factual questions don't get decided by the court, legal questions do. So when you, in the statute, when you include all those factual questions, that's just a re recipe for litigation instead of clarity. So if you want to actually have protection, I think it's really important to describe what is protected. Right now, this series of factual questions means that you get sued, you go through months or years of discovery, which is when everybody exchanges information. You're likely going to have to pay an expert, hire an expert to be able to assess these factual questions. When you think that a lawyer probably costs you between two and $300 an hour, some maybe a little bit less, some a little bit more, but just to pay for an attorney for a week's worth of time is a week, 40 hour week, 8,000 to 12,000 hours just for that one week of time. One week of time is nowhere near enough to go through discovery, defending the claim, filing motions, going to trial. It's just a really big cost. And what I think is problematic about that is mo most neighbors, I don't think, want to sue one another. So that works pretty well. And back to Senator Campion's question about how many lawsuits have there been, I don't, I don't think that's the right question because I think the question is what is the protection and does it work? And, and the reason I say well, that- I'm always looking for what's the problem that we're trying to solve. It might be the way for me to rephrase that. And that's yeah. what I'm trying to yeah. explain now, is what is the problem, is that I don't think the protection that the statute was designed to no. include is actually was ever effectuated. And I think part of that is when you think about this law being adopted and, or enacted in 1981, farms weren't regulated then, their land use practices. There, so, so maybe at that time, the only remedy for a neighbor who didn't like something a farm was doing was through a nuisance action. Since that time, there's been, a, as you are all very familiar with, has been a whole litany of additional regulations, many targeting water quality, but others targeting other things. So there's this whole rubric of requirements now. So I, I think our perspective is that rather than farm practices being decided in individual, being decided, sorry, in individual civil actions between neighbors and farmers, the state, meaning you all, should be determining what is an appropriate farm practice. Because farms are in the unique position of living where they work, most of them. So they, they are, you know, they're at their home and they're doing practices that do have impacts. Manure stinks, it just does. Um, some people don't mind the smell, some people do. It varies at different times, but if, if the state thinks that manure smell is a legitimate nuisance claim, even if the farmer is doing everything right to manage it, that's a huge risk to the farm. If the farm does everything proper with its manure according to state, according to state requirements, but it's still subject to civil suit, that, I mean, that just the cost of defending that suit could put a vulnerable farm out of business. 
So the, the way that I think about this is instead of individual neighbors deciding what's a good farm practice, the state should be deciding what's a good farm practice is, or good practice. And, and, and if the farmer is meeting those expectations and is reasonably and responsibly running the farm, they ought to be protected from a distinct civil action, which literally can drive them out of business. And where this really can get exploited is if you have a wealthy neighbor and a farmer. Because wealthy neighbors, the cost of litigation can be irrelevant. And just through the threat of litigation, and then specifically through the cost of litigation, a wealthy neighbor who may not, who may be new to the area or not, but just may not like the practice, can literally drive a farm out of business. And since the goal of this protection is to keep Vermont productive in agriculture, the idea that somebody who's well healed can, can take advantage of someone who isn't by bringing an action against someone who's doing everything within the scope of the law is a little unsettling. So to back to your question, Senator Campion, I think what we should be trying to do is determine on a state level what's appropriate. And then if farms are meeting those standards, they ought, they ought to be insulated from legal liability. So that may be part of the reason that several of have talked about uh, if a farm is complying in good standing with the RAPs, which are a lot of practices that we've required, um, that should be an aspect that needs to be uh, in, the, in the bill. Yeah, and that to me is a really interesting question because right now, the way, the way that the statute is worded currently, there's these four thresholds that a farm has to meet. The, it's Generally speaking, when a plaintiff sues somebody, they have the burden of proof, mean, meaning they have to prove that somebody violated the law. But the way the statute is set up right now, it's kind of, in my view, and I'm not sure that it's been interpreted exactly this way, but it's almost set up more as an affirmative defense, which means that the burden is on the defendant to prove it. Oh. So the way it's worded is the farm has to prove that they're complying with all laws. Well, that's kind of crazy. <laughs> because that's, the way, all, that's the way most laws are written. Anytime I've gone to court, I had to prove I was innocent uh, <laughs> more than the plaintiff had to prove I was guilty. I mean, well, that, that I don't know if that ever happened to anybody else. <laughs> it's certainly, yeah. Let's go around the table. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I think the scope is really broad to say you have to conform with all laws. I personally believe that the law that should matter is the one that's related to the nuisance. And what I mean by that is, let's say, you know, farms have to have buffers that meet certain requirements on the edge of their field, depending on where the field is located. If somebody doesn't have the appropriate size buffer, that's a violation of the RAPs that absolutely should be addressed. But if a neighbor doesn't like the smell of manure, and that's what they're complaining about a nuisance, that buffer doesn't have anything to do with the manure at all. So, so my opinion, the burden should be on the plaintiff to prove that there is a legal violation, meaning the farm's not meeting state requirements, and that that is causally related to the nuisance itself. Because it's just too broad otherwise. Again, it's a discovery. I mean, if, if a farm literally has to prove they're doing everything right, that's impossible. I mean, you, right. you can't, it's not something you can actually do. To prove, it's almost like proving a negative. So what should matter is, what is the source of the alleged nuisance? What is the farm doing that's causing that alleged nuisance? and are the activities related to that activity following state law? So I, I recommend sort of tightening the scope, putting the burden on the plaintiff to prove that the farm is doing something that doesn't meet the requirements, and because of that, there's this nuisance activity. N nobody's suggesting that neighbors shouldn't be protected from bad practices. Neighbors have a right to the use and enjoyment of their property. They have a right to, to live where they do. They should be able to do so without unreasonable uh, um, interference by a farm. But if the state decides these farm practices are appropriate, and, and since we do want farming and we do want farms to be able to diversify and change, it seems like that should be the threshold, not an individual neighbor's tolerances for those activities. Smell yeah, so if all of a sudden you know, you've got two neighbors, they've been living side by side for 10 years, great relationship, Neighbors growing, I don't know, strawberries, big piece of property. And all of a sudden, they sell. 
They sell to somebody out in California. Landlord lives out in California. They're running the farm kind of from California. And then they decide, we're gonna switch this farm around. We're gonna put a couple manure pits here. We're gonna put something right over here. And it's really not what folks, as you can imagine, may have signed up for. What happens? That person's like, hey, geez. Geez, you should have thought twice before buying this 10 years ago. Well, I think, I'm just wondering under this, under how this is drafted. Under the current law. No, under how this is drafted. I haven't um, had a, I quickly looked at the draft, the draft but I haven't really studied okay. that. But I, to me, whatever draft is there right yeah. now, the bigger question is what should the policy be? And, and I guess what I'm suggesting. But I'm wondering from the neighbor's perspective, they've lived there 10, 20 years. Now they're looking, they were looking at strawberry fields. Now they're looking at the newer heads right on there. Do they have any, in your opinion, should they have any recourse at all? I mean, it's just a yes or no question. No, it's not, because it depends on how you construct the protection. And I think there are a variety of ways to do it. I think the issue you're bringing up is coming to a nuisance, in which Carolyn Gordon also raised. The question is whether or not people who pre-existed are yeah. the only ones who should be protected, or whether agriculture more broadly should be protected. And I think that's an important policy question. Okay. I think there's a reasonable position to take to say, if you are changing your practice, yeah. but you're doing it appropriately, meaning you're managing your manure appropriately, you're following all the laws and requirements, then there's no reason that because you've changed, I mean, another neighbor somewhere down the road who has to deal with it when it pre-existed, why can't this neighbor? That's a policy question. Right now, it's set up to only protect those who pre-existed. Whether so that's, you're not testifying on this current bill. You haven't read the bill. I, I skimmed it quickly okay. last night, okay. but it was more, okay. I was trying to highlight the, 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 the flaws that I think exist now. Okay. And I think there are important policy questions about, how, and a lot of options about how to design that protection yeah. moving forward. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. <clears throat> Other questions for state? No. Uh, I'll just say one thing. I, I appreciate this, Steve, and I think the committee, when we took a look at the uh, presumption of rebuttable uh, presumption at all, we really realized, I think, that that's something that we need to look at first. How we do this with our council remains to be seen. This, I'm sure, will change over the next few weeks. Yeah. But to your point, the, the current law just doesn't do it. I don't believe. Um, I'll just add to Joe Tisbert, who was uh, there. I was in the courtroom for more than one day with that case back in Rutland with the bull that got up loose and there was a fatality involved. And I could see the absolute distress on the face of the farmer who was involved. So I can sympathize with that. I come from a long line of uh, broadcasting. That's what I did for 45, 50 years in Rutland. So the publicity associated with that case, because that's how we sell newspapers and that's how we keep listeners to radio stations, right. made it pretty well obvious how the media felt about it, that it was the farmer's fault and the bull got out and somebody got killed over it. So it wasn't a fair situation if you were the farmer, for sure, because there was no negligence in my view. Well, I guess you could argue that, but anyway, it was one more example of putting farmers in a bad light and that's the way I saw it. And to the chair's point earlier, if in fact, if uh, let's say the price of uh, underweight's 19 bucks, and we're not talking about a level playing field, if Vermont is really, and if I did the math right, $17.24, when all the surrounding states are at 19, we're really behind the eight ball by $1.76 to begin with. I think we need to do something here in, in this committee. And I, I think most of the committee members agree. What that may wind up with, I don't know yet, but I, I think we're definitely going to take a look at Work this. in that direction. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. Uh, Bill? I, I'd like to say one other thing, <laughs> and good testimony, anyway, <laughs> but I'd like to say one other thing. Um, the, the attorney, uh, Brooke Duar, he said, I think the bill drafted is certainly an improvement over current Vermont law head and shoulders better. So, so that's. So we that, got something to That gives us an idea that we're headed in a, in a positive direction. Yeah. But, you know, like Mr. Collier was saying, uh, 
the farmer, and the Mazda also said, the farmer is presuming that if they're following the law and they're in compliance, that it indemnifies the farmer. But I'm hoping that's the case, but is it not necessarily so? Oh, that's the question. Yeah. You, can't, you can't protect everybody from everything. You know. <laughs> Some states do have attorney cost provisions built in so that the farmer is awarded attorney cost if, if the litigation is brought and then the suit is dismissed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Amanda's got a question. Amanda? <laughs> Thank you. I just wanted to weigh in on the example that was proposed earlier about the neighbor and the farmer <clears throat> changing from strawberries to dairy. And I would just say that in most towns and certainly with the regional planning, our land is designated for certain practices and certainly when it's land trusted land. So if the strawberry farmer wasn't able to afford a living growing strawberries and he wanted to look to a different type of agriculture, and it fell in the realm of the regulatory of the town and the county and, and you know, went through those adequate measures, then I would afford the, the argument that um, they should be protected. And I would say the same thing is happening in the housing development. How many houses were one family homes that are now being developed into apartments or condos or townhomes? There's a field, a neighbor, you know, was was next to a beautiful field that all of a sudden got developed. Not all of a sudden, there's, there's you know, Act 250 and different things, but yet this is where they located to. And now it's changed to a townhomes. I think that that's society and that society drives the changes in our environment. And for us to have the makeup we have, ag land designated either by, you know, town zoning or regulatory, you know, county planning or investment in land trust really needs to be protected to be used as ag. And if you can't make a living growing strawberries, I'm just using the example, and you need to switch the type of agriculture that you do, I think that that affords uh, the Vermont, it, it, it offers some protection and it keeps our lands open as a working landscape. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Thanks, thanks Amanda. Um, well, um, we've we've got a rosy uh, from Ed. People are coming at uh, quarter e, quarter of eleven. So, uh, Laura, did you have something you wanted? Just a couple things. I know you're you're trying to get moving. Um, just a couple things, real quick. Just want to make sure you're aware of um, in the RAPs the way that we operate. Um, we don't have nuisance protections within them per se. So like in the large farm rules, we have direct authority to regulate nuisance. So odor flies, noise traffic, and other pests. But in the RAPs, we do not specifically have like this, you will regulate these, these nuisance, but we regulate farming activities, right? And just to share with you some of the complaints and types of things that I've been getting over at least the last year, I've been getting them for years, but um, Generally, what I hear is, well, one, people who are frustrated and call us because they're seeing something. Like an example would be manure trucks going back and forth, and there, there's a billion of them, and how could this be? And they must be taking it somewhere, and it must be a flood of manure wherever it's going. When in reality, you know, we, we, we investigate, we do the work, and they're moving it from one manure pit to another manure pit um, so that they can maybe do digestion in one place and do the energy and all the climate goals that everybody has, but then also make sure they meet the nutrient management goals. So. Um, that doesn't satisfy some of those people. They don't understand that it doesn't work for them. And, um, but we say that that's how that is, right? Um, the other area is cannons and sounds. That's one area that people get very frustrated about. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times it's blueberry crops where people are shooting off cannons to get birds away so they don't eat their crops. Um, that one comes up about every three years, I would say. Um, and it really bothers people because it's a very intense um, regiment of cannons going off very loudly. But I have personally found it very interesting that in all these cases that I've had people complain, the actual farmer lives there too. So um, they were all, they're both dealing with what's going on. Um, 
So the last one I'll say that we've had a few this year um, is livestock moving off the property. And you know, what is our role in terms of keeping those livestock on the property? And we don't have a role in that space, right? We, we can cost share for fencing potentially if there's a water quality issue, but yeah. otherwise it's the farmer's responsibility to maintain those animals and keep them on their property. Um, and then it becomes the potentially the life, not the livestock, sorry, the health officer of yeah, a town, town or the town's yeah, control line. or the police jurisdiction. So um, a lot of people think we have that role and responsibility to be able to deal with that, but um, we don't. So I just wanted to explain some of the things that the RAPs don't cover necessarily, but we're somehow tangentially involved. Um, manure on the road is another one that comes up quite a bit, especially around at stop signs because the, the yeah. stop and go um, may have a release and then... Uh, if we could control the climate, then the mud on the road might slow down. So. Anyways, so yeah, our jurisdiction over these nuisance things are specific in LFO authority, but no other authority within the agency. Hmm. Good to know. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, it's been a, Michael, we still haven't gotten to you to go through the uh, draft. Yeah, we need to go um, through the draft. I, I don't know what your schedule is. Uh, for the rest of the week, but, um, Friday morning I'm scheduled, but Thursday tomorrow I am not. I don't believe it. Um, <clears throat> but I think you have. We have a full house. Tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But Friday yeah. morning. Friday morning I'm in house act. Yeah. Is that most of the morning, uh, Michael? Uh, it's as soon as they get off the floor until noon. In, what are we? No. Well, we we uh, we operate, you know, starting at nine. Sure, we can be here at nine. And uh, <coughs> we've got that open, right, Linda? Mm -hmm. Yes. So we could uh, run through that with uh, with Michael and get uh, get what he has uh, down and. That, of course, will be on Zoom if any of you want to listen in yeah. and take part. Um, you know, you're more than welcome. Uh, Linda can send a, a Zoom link out to, to everybody. Well, it'd be nice to listen in, at least, you know. Well, yeah, you can listen, but you can't say, hey, you guys are going the wrong direction here. We have. <laughs> but, so, you know, if you want to get on, hey, feel free because, uh, you know, we're, uh, we're here to serve uh, you people, not just to listen to ourselves. So, uh, uh, we appreciate the effort. Thank you. Yeah. And, Doctor, if you have time, I, you know, you or your crew, any of them, um, feel free to, uh, to uh, you know, if you just email Linda, okay. uh, she can give you a link to, yeah. you know, to do that. Uh, just before the break, what, what, what I hear a lot of now is that more and more tractors traveling further and equipment traveling further and further. Um, I hear a lot of people um, complaining about um, agricultural um, equipment on the roads. Oh, yeah. And you see big backups of traffic when, and as they're moving equipment back and forth. I know you guys move stuff from East Montpelier to Crassberry. Sure. Um, and as farmers get bigger they're, and they travel further and further afield to get further Field, but, um, to get to their fields and get to their crops and you know whether it's shit or whether it's um, I can sit on Route 15 and I can see traffic backed up at times half a mile or a mile well, and everybody's in a hurry and cool. everybody's you know. in a hurry yeah. and they can't wait to pass and there's um, yeah, I know last year there was um, one incident in town an accident um, passing tractors and I hear about that all the time now. Well, just a reminder, in the last decade for sure, maybe a little bit longer than that, um, 
we have pushed farmers to make more liquid, right? So water quality regulations yep. mean total collection, and that means you have to move it farther. So you know the policies that we also set up are, are also driving some of that distance that farmers I, have to. Uh, move. Yeah. I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm just raising the issue, and it isn't just manure. It is. Um, oh, feed it, the whole line. The feed when you know yeah. when, the, when they're planting in the spring or in the fall. If you're um, cutting corn, and again, it, it's all of the above. No, uh, that's where that some of that dollar and seventy yeah, I, eight I, cents I, comes totally from. Right. I just uh, but I keep you know. piling on the regs and uh, ways that. We want people to operate. It costs more money, so it costs our farmers more. So they have to get, go from a thirty-two hundred gallon spreader to a seven thousand gallon spreader. So that's bigger, wider, longer, heavier. But anyways, um, hopefully uh, we'll uh, we'll get something here drafted up and rolling uh, shortly. Uh, so. Uh, we're going to take a little bit of break. Rosie, we'll be back in five minutes oh, or so. Good. So we're back uh, live and uh, want to call the committee back to order. Um, we have uh, Rosie uh, Kruger uh, with us from the Department of Ed. And uh, we're going to get a little update maybe in regards to the universal school meals program that uh, we uh, over the last several years have spent quite a lot of time uh, talking about and and finally uh, getting uh, the universal meals program uh, set up last year um, and uh, it was set up for a one-year period, uh, and then we we're going to get uh, reviewed uh, this session and try to get it. Some of us are trying to get it renewed, um, but uh, we need to know, you know, how it worked and and uh, how schools are managing their sign-ups in there. Uh, getting their people to fill out their disclosure forms and all all the uh, knowledge that goes along with trying to get a bill reauthorized uh, for this uh, next year. So, uh, Rosie, we have three new people, uh, one brand new, uh, Irene. Uh, so we'll introduce ourselves and uh, we'll go from there. Brian Collimore from the Rutland District. Irene Renner, Chittenden North, which includes Fairfax and Franklin County. Brian Campy in Bennington County. Uh, Rich Wesley from Lamb. And uh, Bobby Starr from Orleans. So, uh, welcome and good to uh, see you. So, um, thank you. For the record, I'm Rosie Kruger. I'm the State Director of Child Nutrition Programs at the Agency of Education. Um, and I oversee a team of uh, eight and a half folks who um, help me uh, implement, we're the, the state agency that is responsible for implementing um, all of the federal child nutrition programs in the state of Vermont. Um, and so um, we uh, conduct all the, the oversight of those programs um, and pass through the funding to schools, um, child cares, nonprofit organizations around the state who are actually the ones um, providing the, the meals uh, to children. Um, so um, the Agency of Education has submitted the requested universal meals uh, report um, updating you on the implementation so far this year. Um, so that's available on the reports uh, section of the legislature's website. And then just yesterday, we submitted the local foods incentive report as well, um, which you might be interested in. I know that's not the, the topic today, but um, just giving you a heads up that that has been submitted. Um, and we've shared that with Linda as well. Um, so I, I didn't prepare extensive testimony today. Um, I can kind of walk you through a little bit about what's in the report, but I'm really happy to kind of follow your lead in terms of what pieces of, of um, information you're specifically interested in. Um, 
So I can kind of start with telling you a little bit about what we've done to implement universal meals um, this year and how it's gone so far. Um, and then we can kind of go from there in terms of your questions. Yeah. Um, so the agency did a lot of work over the summer months to prepare. Um, we, uh, maybe I should start for the new members um, with kind of describing um, how uh, CEP and Provision 2, which are the two federal options that we've used to provide universal meals, um, those are two options that have um, the long existed. Schools have the option to offer universal meals that way. Um, but they require local funding. Um, and so that was kind of the, the rub. And um, some schools in Vermont prior to COVID had been using those options to provide universal meals. Um, but uh, during COVID, the federal government provided funding uh, for all the schools to provide meals at no charge to all students. Um, and so then coming out of that, um, those, those federal waivers to allow that ended in June of 2022, um, that's when we started implementing this one-year um, universal meals uh, bill that the, the legislature passed last year. Um, so that bill um, provides federal funding to cover the cost of what we call the paid student share of meals. So under the federal programs, um, we have three categories of meals, uh, free, reduced, and paid. And the federal government reimburses those meals at a different rate for each category. Um, as long as the meal meets the federal meal pattern requirements. So it has to have certain components to be considered a reimbursable meal. Um, and so uh, the free meals are reimbursed by the, the feds at the free reimbursement rate, um, which is meant to really cover the cost of the meal. Um, the reduced meals are covered by the feds at that free rate minus 40 cents per lunch and 30 cents per breakfast, which the, is supposed to be covered by the students' family under the normal circumstances, but in Vermont we have long paid for that at the state level. Um, so those meals are still at no charge to those students, but we're drawing down a little less federal reimbursement. And then we have the paid meals, um, which still actually do draw down a little bit of federal funding. Those are still subsidized by the federal government, um, but those are um, not fully, you know, it's, it's just a little bit of federal funding, about 40 cents per meal. Um, and then the remainder normally comes from the household. Um, and so, what does a, a full meal cost? Uh, does it vary much? It varies. Um, so the the it's just generally right now about four fifty, um, if you were to pay for that meal. Um, the the paid meals can't be subsidized by the free and reduced price meals. So the federal government sets a minimum price for the paid meals, and then the schools can charge more than that if they want. Um, and again, this is not happening in Vermont public schools this year because the state's um, paying that, that difference. Um, so uh, Act 151, which is the Universal Meals Bill last year, um, that provides for state funding for the difference between that free reimbursement rate and that paid reimbursement rate if the school <laughs> operates either the community eligibility provision or provision two, which are these two federal options that allow us to draw down the most federal funds. Um, Act 151 also requires that schools offer meals at no charge to all students this year. So theoretically, the school could choose to not operate one of those two options, but then they'd be missing out on the state funding. So all the, the schools wisely chose to operate those options, um, and we're, we're drawing down the most federal funding we could be. Um, so um, under the community eligibility provision, um, meals are reimbursed for um, uh, we, we look at the number of, let's see, let's go back to um, how a child might qualify for free or reduced price meals. Um, so uh, if a household um, makes under 130% of the federal poverty level, they can apply for free and re reduced price meals, uh, or for free meals via an application um, showing their income. If they uh, make under 185% of the qual federal poverty level for their household size, they can apply for reduced price meals via an application. So that's um, the group that qualifies via applications. And then there's this other group of students who could qualify for free meals via direct certification. And that's when they participate in another means-tested program, such as Three Squares Vermont. Um, and so um, DCF 
kind of communicates to AOE every month the names of the children and households participating in Three Squares Vermont and reach up and we then push that information down to the schools, they match those students, and those families don't have to submit an application. So households may qualify for, for meals in those variety of ways. Under the community eligibility provision, we don't collect applications at all. We just look at the number of kids who are directly certified for free meals, and we multiply that by a, a multiplier of 1.6. Um, and that is the percent of meals that we're able to claim at the free reimbursement rate, and then the remainder of those meals are claimed at the paid reimbursement rate. And that's where that state funding is coming in for those CEP schools. For schools operating provision two, um, you collect applications in the first year of a five-year cycle, uh, or sorry, a four-year cycle. Um, and in that first year, you count who eats um, and you claim based on the status of the kids who eat, even though meals are served for free to all those students. Um, but then uh, in the subsequent years, you're not counting which students are eating, you're not collecting applications, you're just applying those claiming percentages established in that first year to the total number of meals that were served. Can I just, yeah. <laughs> is, is three squares a different um, um, poverty level than, um, um, than the first two programs, 185%? Um, so three squares is under 130 percent. I'm not actually sure if their cutoff okay. is right so at 130, below. but it's oh, it's okay. below. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, who who does all this uh, checking? Uh, the local school or so? The agency yeah. So the, or? the schools are the ones who are the determining officials who are determining whether or not a child is eligible for free and reduced price meals. But the agency has an oversight role. And so I mentioned, we did a bunch of work this summer to implement universal meals. Our oversight role is that for um, schools participating in the community eligibility provision, we have to look at a sample of all their directly certified students and make sure that they actually correctly directly certified those students. We did that over the summer months. The other thing that we need to do is um, schools can participate in the community eligibility provision based on either their own status as a building, or we can combine them with other buildings in that school food authority, which in Vermont is the supervised reunion. And if the average of those buildings um, is, if, if more than 40% of the students are directly certified for free meals um, in all those buildings, then all of those buildings can participate in the community eligibility provision, even if a single building there would not have met that cutoff. So we spent a lot of time this summer kind of mixing and matching to figure out um, which schools within school food authorities should be grouped together in order to maximize the number of schools participating in CEP. So we got to 91 schools, um, which is uh, more schools than previously had been participating in CEP. Um, and then the remainder, 221, are participating in provision two. So the agency's oversight role for provision two is that we have to um, look at both the direct certification and the free and reduced meal applications for those schools that are in their first year of provision two to again make sure that they've done it correctly because in the subsequent years all their claiming percentages are going to be based on that base year. Um, and that work has been more intensive than we expected. Um, it's been time consuming for the schools to get us that information. Um, and my team is still finishing up. We've been working on it all fall and we're still finishing up a few of those reviews um, and struggling with a few schools to get information from them, I'm sure, because they're very busy, um, but that's that's held that up. So, um, but but we did all the, the CEP work. We're in process on the provision two work. Um, schools are serving meals at no charge. We've provided guidance um, over the summer months on how to do this. Um, and uh, the agency also did a big fill the form campaign this fall, um, really pushing households to return free and reduced meal applications yeah. if those were what was requested for the provision two schools or the household income form for those schools participating in CEP. Now, do you have to do that each year or is this one of the ones that will go for four years? Yeah, so um, CEP and Provision 2 both have these, these cycles. Um, so for Provision 2, um, you know, I mentioned it's a four-year cycle. So in subsequent years, we don't need to collect applications for the school meals programs. 
but schools do still need individual student poverty data as a metric of student poverty for all their other educational programs. And so one of the ways of collecting that data, because we can't collect the free and reduced meal application at that time for those schools, is to collect a household income form. So that work, if we need individual student poverty data, has to continue on each year. Each year. Um, if, if that's the metric that we're going to use. Yeah. Um, and the agency has been doing a lot of work over the last few years to figure out, you know, is this the correct metric to use? Is there an alternative available? Um, and Anne can speak more to that if that's something that you're interested in. Yeah. Um, so uh, we, let's see, we've done uh, that, that work. Um, schools are um, offering meals at no charge. Um, we have uh, participation and claims data for the first two months of the school year up until the end of October. Schools have 60 days from the month end to submit that, um, those claims information, or that claims information to us. So we um, don't yet have information uh, for the later months and we'll be watching that really closely. Um, based on that information for the first couple months of the school year, we are seeing an increase in participation. Um, we've, for lunch, uh, this is in the report, um, but we've gone from about 50% of students participating daily to about 60% of students participating daily as of October. Um, so definitely an increase in participation. So it's only 10, I don't know where, but I read 16% somewhere. So you I, probably heard that from somebody who talked to me. I was looking at some initial data for September um, and kind of analyzing that and came up with 16, but now we've got better data. It's um, leveled out. Yeah. Well, not just that it's leveled out, it's, it's, it's more solid data. That was kind of some preliminary stuff missing a couple of schools. Yeah. So get this right, so we have 60% participation with 100% everybody covered. Meals are free to all students, yep. and on each day, about 60% of students are eating. Okay. And we we think that... Um, and that's up from 50. That's up from 50. Um, so participation is one of the big factors in terms of how much universal meals will cost. You know, we, yeah. you know, JFO had done a range of estimates based on, you know, a lower level of participation or kind of staying um, at the same level as previously, all the way up to 100% participation. Um, and we knew the true number was going to fall somewhere in there, but we weren't sure. I want to caution you that I don't think September is necessarily. It's not gonna stay at 60. There's a couple of factors that we think could be suppressing participation right now. Um, and I can go through those for you. Um, one is that in these provision two schools um, where they're having to count the actual students who are eating this year, the, the names of the students who are eating rather than just, okay, that's a reimbursable meal, that's a reimbursable meal. Um, that takes more time to count that. Um, and that is a, just a, a base year problem, a first year provision two. Um, in those schools, the, ch the students, as they go through the line, they have to enter either a PIN number or swipe a card or somebody has to check their name off a paper roster or um, you know, type their name into a computer system because we need to record this actual student is eating because then somebody back in the office needs to figure out, okay, this student is a free eligible student or this student is a paid eligible student, and that's what makes up the claim that goes to the state. Versus prior, um, in prior years when we were doing, the, the last couple years when we were doing uh, universal meals under the USDA waivers, it was just counting, you know, meal, meal, meal. Um, and so that's taking more time to go through the line. So um, the lines are longer. Uh, because participation is up and it takes each student uh, more time to go through the line. Some schools have responded to that by moving uh, school food service staff from the serving line or from the kitchen where they're preparing meals or serving meals to the point of sale. Um, and so that's an attempt to, bring those, to make those lines shorter. But that, of course, impacts the offerings available. So we've heard from a couple of schools that they've had to eliminate, you know, the make your own sandwich bar, which is really, there's a, a staff person there who's helping you make the sandwich, um, or eliminate some of their scratch cooking, culinary options, um, some entrees, and that sort of thing. So there's fewer offerings. Um, so that could be um, decreasing participation for sure. And we have heard in some schools, you know, kids complaining about, we, we really liked this option and we can't have that anymore. Um, 
in the other way that that may be decreasing participation is that um, a typical school in Vermont um, has a lunch period of 20 to 25 minutes and that includes the amount of time it takes to stand in line to get your meal so if you have other options which might be bringing a meal from home or just choosing not to eat you might use those options rather than st spend time in line because you might want to you know obviously you might want to get to the table to eat quicker um, you might want to spend that time socializing going to recess um, so that could really be decreasing participation the among students who have other schools options. Schools don't have ID, students don't have ID cards with their name on them. So For swiping? If, well, if they, if every student had an ID mm -hmm. card. Many, many schools do. All they'd have yep. to do is yeah. at the end of the counter, put your card in, pull it out, and it, you're checked through. So many schools do, and many schools are using that kind of a system, but that still just takes just a little bit more time than you know, just checking off like tally marks, which is basically what they were doing previously. Yeah, so breakfast versus lunch. How many kids participate in breakfast? Yeah, I have those numbers versus in the report. Versus lunch, and let is me, there a diff There is a difference. And, and why? Um, so breakfast is a little bit lower, although we still saw increases in participation. I want to give you the actual number, so I'm just going to pull the report up for you. Um, sorry, it's taking a minute. Um, so we have definitely seen increases in participation um, in breakfast participation this year, um, but it is lower than lunch. Um, you know, obviously a lot of kids do get lunch at home. Or, sorry, breakfast at home, um, and so they may not be taking a, an additional breakfast at school. Um, so that probably explains most of it. Um, schools have done interesting things about offering um, meals in the classroom um, so that it's definitely available for any kid who needs it. Um, breakfast, so breakfast after the bell, grab and go breakfast, um, you know, having like bag breakfast, like I was saying, that can be taken to the classroom, um, but it is lower. And I assume that that's because some of those kids are getting that meal at home. Let me pull up the participation for you. Um, so uh, for breakfast, prior to COVID, um, we had a participation rate of 28.56%. And as of October 2022, it was 38.63%. Right. So it's up 10%, yeah. and yeah. so is and so is lunch. Yeah, both are up 10%. Um, so, uh -huh. you know, that was one big factor that we think um, might be suppressing participation at those provision two schools. Um, when schools are pulling uh, workers off the line, um, we mentioned that that might um, be impacting meal quality. In addition, there are just big staffing shortages right now in the school meals programs, um, and I'm hearing from lots of directors who are having to substitute in the kitchens. Um, these are the folks who normally would be doing the menu planning, the training, the ordering, um, and so they're not as able to spend as much time doing that. Um, and so we don't have any hard data on this, but it feels like meal quality might be a little bit lower this year um, because of those, those staffing pressures. Um, in addition, those makes sense. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you can't hire people, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, those programs are also facing um, supply chain issues still, um, and that has meant a lot of weird substitutions. And so we do see, you know, parents complaining or kids complaining that, like, well, they served this item with this other item, and that didn't really make any sense. And usually that's because of a substitution. So that meal quality is just being still still being impacted. Um, so those things could be reducing participation for sure um, for among, among kids who have other options. Yeah. And then the last thing is probably attendance. Um, we don't have attendance data yet for this school year, uh, yeah. but there were lots of respiratory diseases, including COVID, circulating this fall. And you know, anecdotally, we certainly heard about a lot more absences than usual um, because of illness. And but so your numbers are up though from. 10% in both categories. Right. So, so, so what I'm saying is that we expect that those numbers could increase further. We don't want you to do cost estimates, you know, for the next five years, assuming a 60% participation rate. You could see, you know, after this base year provision two passes and we're back to having faster lines, um, if schools are able to resolve some of these meal quality issues. 
um, we could see participation increase further. So we'll be keeping a real close eye on what happens you know, in the November and December claims to see it, it increased even from September to October. So we want to see if, you know, is that a trend or, you know. Um, Brian. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So Rosie, I guess I'm uh, still trying to grapple with the numbers here. Um, the plan was to use the federal money to provide breakfast and lunch for all students. If only 30% of those students are taking advantage of, I think you said breakfast, how did that affect, in other words, we put money aside that said, okay, if 100% of the students eat breakfast and 100% of the students eat lunch, it'll cost this amount of money. Yeah. Since only 30% are taking advantage of our offer, how did that affect what we're spending? So there was a range that JOFO presented to you, and the bottom end of the range was no change to participation and um, no change to the parents um, or the households returning the free and reduced meal application forms. And I'm going to talk about that one in a second because that's another factor that we have data on now. Um, and the top end of the range was everybody participating um, and nobody returning free and reduced meal applications. That top end is around $39 million. You all appropriated 27, or 28, sorry, 29 million, kind of guessing that we'd fall somewhere in the middle of the range. Okay. Um, so there's not <laughs> tens of millions of dollars um, on the table. The other piece of data we have at this point is we have the percent of households who returned free and reduced meal applications. Um, so uh, prior to COVID, about 38% of Vermont house, or of students um, qualified for free and reduced price meals. And that was partially households who qualified via direct certification, and then partially households who qualified via um, applications. We weren't sure, there's, there's no incentive for households to return applications when meals are free. So we weren't sure how that would be impacted. We did do a big campaign to try and get households to do that. That was supported by Hunger Free Vermont. And we found that there definitely was a decline in households returning applications but about 3,000 families did continue to return applications, or 3,000 students continued to qualify via application. Um, so that brought our free and reduced percentage statewide down to uh, around 34%, um, and the exact numbers are in the report for you. So there was a, definitely um, a decline from pre-COVID when we were charging for meals, um, but we did still have um, some, some students qualifying via application, and then of course all of those students who qualified via direct certification that wasn't impacted at all. They continued to qualify that way. Um, so we, um, we can take those numbers and say that around 65% of students don't qualify for free and reduced price meals. Um, and we can apply that this year um, and say that if students ate uh, according to, like in, in direct proportion to the eligibility, so if, if if we don't have more paid students eating um, proportionally to free and reduced price students. Um, we can apply that to our participation rates uh, as of October, and if participation doesn't change, um, we'd be spending uh, something like $27 million um, to, for, to fund the state portion of universal meals. And the, the exact uh, math is in, in that report for you. Um, so we're going to keep watching that really closely um, because obviously participation could increase um, and there could potentially be, you know, students not eating exactly in proportion to uh, their categories. Um, we would expect to see more free and reduced eligible students eating than paid students and so hopefully that, that will play out and that won't um, impact the, the price and increase the, the cost. But we're going to be watching that number really closely, um, yeah. and we'll we'll let you know should it uh, exceed or look like it's on track to exceed that appropriated amount. So, are the school districts? Are you working with the supervisor unions or individuals, town school districts? Is it both? We work at the, with the supervisor union level. Um, so, so if there was some way to uh, to uh, reward them or punish them for not doing so uh, yeah we really are limited by any the the federal programs um the requirement is that the meal application is voluntary 
So we've really tried to support the districts in collecting those applications and um, our fill the form campaign gave them language to, um, to send out to households, posters, social media, um, and Hunger Free Vermont supported a lot of that work with doing some um, marketing directly to households as well. But we can't require that households submit the free and reduced meal application. Um, that's, that's not allowed. Um, so, yeah. So, to follow up, so if we had everybody participate, breakfast and lunch, that's um, 39 in that range. Everybody participating and no households returning applications. Okay. So those are the two but, factors. But that the top yeah. level yeah. Is, is 39 million. So, but we have what we know of 60% of the uh, people participating in, in lunch. We have someplace just under 40% doing breakfast. So even with the 29 that we had, because if in my brain the 29 is probably about 75% participation across the state would eat that up, we're going to have money left over in, um, from that number. Of the 20, we, we have probably you appropriate 20, 20 29. 29. Um, 29. Yeah, so should be that's 70, left. so there should be money left over from that. And we're what we're looking at if the numbers hold true, um, even if we were at the 60 percent level across all of it, that's about 23 million. I, I'm not sure I follow where the 23 million is well, coming from. Uh, I'm, if we're at the 60 percent level and 60 percent of everybody did breakfast and lunch, that so if if we had um, current participation, 60 percent of breakfast, oh, sorry, 60 percent participating in lunch and 38 percent participating. Well, in I did. I, I just we'll, we'll bump the breakfast up. When I when I did the math to get to 27 million, that was based on those um, October participation rates, and based on the uh, free and reduced meal application return rate, the free and reduced percentage that we had this fall, and so that gets us yes, to my, about. My question is, how do you get to the 27? Yeah. Um, so uh, the other factor that changed this year was the free and reduced. Um, reimbursement the pre reduced and paid reimbursements from the federal government those increased as of July 1st um, so last year when all that math was done that was based on a um, that the difference between the paid reimbursement rate and the free reimbursement rate for lunch was three dollars and 18 cents and this year um, because those numbers updated as of July 1st at the federal level um, that difference was three dollars and fifty six cents. So when you take that change as well, you apply those new. Uh, it's it's a new per meal cost for the state. We're calling it the universal meal supplement. Mm -hmm. um, when you take that, and you multiply that, um, you take the overall number of students who are enrolled in school meals programs. Mm -hmm. So it's about eighty four thousand students. Multiply that by the 60% participation rate, and that for lunch and the 38 participation rate for breakfast, um, and then you multiply that by 65% of those students would qualify for paid meals, mm -hmm. and then you multiply that by 318 for or sorry 356 for the the universal instead meal supplement instead of the lower instead of the lower one. Yeah. And then you do the same thing for breakfast, except use the breakfast participation rate and use the breakfast uh, per meal reimbursement, which I want to say is a dollar fifty-seven, but I can—it's in the report and I can pull it up. Um, that's what gets you to about twenty-seven million dollars. Yeah. Oh, and so times times one hundred seventy-five school days. I hear what you're doing. I, I still can't get to the twenty-seven in my head. I probably need to see it on yeah, the piece we can. of paper. <laughs> yeah, I don't okay. remember. I don't think I put it in a footnote in the report, but I can certainly because, do it out. Because I'm yeah. going, if the all-in is $40 yeah. million, yeah. I, you know, I... So that all-in of $40 million assumed that prior year reimbursement? It, 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 and so, it assumed the lower yeah. reimbursement, mm -hmm. and, and we're benefiting from a higher reimbursement from the feds. 
So no, we're not. We're it's costing us more money. Oh, it's cost more. Okay. Yeah, that, that's that, why I need yes. to see it. <laughs> the other issue um, on the school lunch program, um, yeah, in most schools, if um, you have the, uh, a librarian, you have a librarian and a librarian. The salary of the librarian goes into the school budget. If you have an athletic program and you have pay coaches, the coaches pay goes into the school budget. But for some reason, we have a hot lunch program. The salaries of those hot lunch people come out of the cost of the lunch program, not it doesn't go to the general fund of the school budget. And if we wanted to bring That's the overall costs down of what children are actually eating, um, you know, school districts could, because they're going to offer insurance programs and retirement programs and, and all these good things to the hot lunch staff. Um, and the kids are going to be paying the bill, or, or Montpelier is. And if if the school district wants to offer uh, these bennies uh, to their staff, well, maybe they should get some skin in the game, and uh, and move those people to the general fund account <coughs> rather than having the children pay. Um, so I, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, the, the school meals programs are an enterprise account. And so they're all the income that comes in from the reimbursements or from any paid meals, a la carte sales, um, uh, you know, sales to teachers, whatever. Um, all of that goes into the enterprise account. And um, it's generally expected that that account breaks even. It can't make a profit, um, but it, that it would break even. It often doesn't, in which case it is it has to be made whole by the general fund. Um, so school meal, pro meal programs are trying to, you know, budget according to the reimbursements that they're they're making and, and make it break even so that they don't have to contribute from the general fund. Um, we did a survey this year as part of the financial report that schools submit to us to find out um, average salary um, for the school food service director, um, what the um, hourly rate was for the lowest paid um, school food service employee, and what benefits are offered, if any. Um, so we do have that data. Oh, we do have that. Um, and that's, um, you know, that, that could be certainly something that's contributing to the, the workforce shortage um, in these programs. Um, the and average. The highest paid uh, people in this town. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, so the average um, starting hourly wage, um, when I say the, the median, the most common, um, was $15 an hour. Um, and the average was closer to $16 an hour. Um, but there were a couple of uh, school districts where um, that hourly wage was low enough as of June of this past year that they were going to need to increase it in order to meet the state's minimum um, minimum wage requirements this year. Um, so, um, you know, when you compare that to, you know, what folks can make working um, in a fast food restaurant, um, that's, that's similar wages or lower, um, and um, it's certainly a challenging job. Um, so, you know, it would be reasonable to expect that that might be um, causing some of the difficulties in hiring. Yeah, uh, I think the staff would get used better if they were paid through the general fund uh, as a non-certified employee. Uh, <clears throat> you know, the bus drivers and custodians and all those people, uh, you know, most school districts have to pay them pretty well to, to uh, get them to come to work. And, uh, but anyway, my thinking to get the cost of the meals down where you know it is covering the cost of the meal um, 
would be less money, but um, just something to think about. Um, what else would you all like to know about how Universal Meals is going this year? There's a, a bunch of stuff in the report. Yeah, I just want to add one thing that, uh, so the local foods incentive grant, mm -hmm. so it looks like the summary says a total of 775, roughly 775,000 was put into the local economy due to food purchasing. So that, I mean, on the surface, that seems like a seems like a good number, but I don't, I don't know why you're comparing it to. No, no, not that I have nothing to compare it to. So that's why I'm looking. Is it? Uh, do you think this will grow? I mean, our hope, of course, is to, you know, gosh, it would be incredible. You know, we heard yesterday from that's farm from local folks. farmers. That's right. Yeah. So yeah, so that's a that seems to me like a good number. But you know, it would, and yesterday we talked about how farm to plate. Ten years ago, I mean, all this stuff was just starting, and now it's huge. Be exciting to see this, which I think is our hope. This is just starting, and ten years it could be huge. I mean, Vermont could be the state where Didn't. food goes from farms right to to kids. So I'm just trying to get a sense of, you know, your impressions yeah. on whether or not there's anything we need to do to kind of get this to grow faster and better and help our farmers, with, you know, that predictability. Yeah. So the, the way that the local foods incentive is structured yeah. um, is that there are two levels of grant. There's the base year grant, um, which is a set of fairly easy requirements for schools to meet. Um, they're eligible for that grant one time, one year. Okay. Um, and so this is the second year of the grant. So we have a bunch of folks who've received that already and moved on to the subsequent year grants. Um, and the subsequent year grants are much more difficult to receive, and that's really attempting to change behavior. Okay. Um, and so in the subsequent year grants, you have to actually prove that you have um, purchased at least 15% um, of your food locally to get the, the um, 15 cents per plate incentive. Which um, I have to say, that's a lot. If you're buying 15% locally, that's oh, a that's really a good start. I mean, that's start. a chunk yeah. of food. So um, we saw, you know, in the first year, lots of schools applying for the base year. This year, um, all of those schools were then eligible to apply for the subsequent year. Mm -hmm. A smaller number did, I want to say it's eight, but it is in the report. Okay. Um, actually, and these are school food authorities, not yeah. individual school buildings, um, actually applied. And I want to say six of them qualified. So there were several that applied that didn't actually qualify. We have yet to audit those ones who, who said that they, you know, they reported to us that they met the threshold. So it's possible that some of those folks will um, be kicked out of the program when we do the audit. We hope not. Um, I hope not, too. Even if they got kind of close. Right? Yeah, well, Pain. we can't. I know. Close I know. is not enough. <laughs> I know, okay. But they're um, working hard for so, it. Yes. Yeah. Um, and we would expect that those, in fact, we did hear from a couple of those folks who um, attempted to qualify this year and didn't, that they planned to to keep trying next year. But aren't there some products that are not uh, eligible to yeah, so you all, get into the 15 You all made some decisions about what you wanted to qualify, and so you specifically excluded milk. Um, yeah, so I milk mean. does not count um, towards the local purchasing incentive, um, and that was a decision that, that you all um, came to. So 15% then is meat and veggies and fruit. And bread products. And bread products. Okay. Not, no, nope. sure. Been in. Yeah. Well, that was my. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I'm just sitting here trying to think. Um, did you have an idea ahead of time, Rosie? Like project you know, about how many students would take advantage of both breakfast and lunch. In other words, you knew at one point that we were at whatever percent it was at 50, and then we went to 60 with the lunch and. Mm -hmm. And the reason I ask is, at some point, the people in the kitchen must have had to know how much food to prepare. If there's 100% of the kids coming through, we need a whole lot of food. And if they didn't, then obviously it's not a good idea to run out of food either. So how did that work? And if they made more than they gave out, where did all that extra food wind up? So that's always a tricky thing for the, the food service programs to figure out. You know, you never know from day to day and different entrees are more popular than others. Yeah. And so you're always trying to figure it out. Um, so um, the 60% the um, is somewhat in line with some limited data that there is available from schools that um, had previously been offering universal meals prior to COVID. Um, so 
that that's um, where some of those initial cost estimates, why we were kind of um, comfortable with some of those ideas about, you know, we'll pick a, a number in the middle. Um, but uh, so that that's that kind of comes from, or uh, we could have expected that based on um, some of that earlier data. Um, but the schools really, you know, the first few days, they're kind of shooting high and they have some backup plans in terms of what, you know, what will they serve if they're running out and, yeah, um, you know, day. you've got, <laughs> you try to serve a, a variety of things, so you've got some options. Um, and um, some schools do ask for pre-orders. Um, so, uh, and, you know, obviously if a student shows up without a meal, they would they find something for them, but that pre-ordering allows them to kind of okay. guess. Um, but yeah, it's it's a tough part of the job to figure out yeah. what they're going to do. Um, and then they're pretty adept at using leftovers um, in the programs. So you know, if you're serving lasagna one day, you may serve those additional servings of lasagna the next day as an additional option on the you know for the okay. entree. The kids can choose between the chicken sandwich and the, the lasagna um, on the second day, that sort of thing. I didn't know a food shelf's made out better because... We, so the, the programs are allowed to donate to a nonprofit organization, uh, 501c3 nonprofit, if they have excess food, um, and some, some do that. They're not, I wouldn't say that that's made a huge, that there's been a huge change in that this year, um, because okay. they, they've always had to plan and yeah. guess. Or, um, <laughs> You know, if, if there's a lot of sickness or a special event happening where, a, you know, the sixth grade class is gone, that's going to impact your numbers. There's always stuff like that going on. So, um, it sounds like the numbers are up. The, the cost is down or so far it, we have... I think you'll be okay on the money. cost. I think that's the message that I want you to take is... is you, you didn't under-appropriate. I wouldn't expect, like I, I don't start planning to spend the, the difference between the 29 and 27 million. We wanna see how participation well, is gonna go. Well, probably for dessert. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> um, we, we wanna get some more data for the next few months and see how it's going. Yeah. Um, certainly if things turn around and participation shoots up, then we may be in a position where we would need additional funds. So um, we just wanna keep a, a close eye on it. I will. I do want to give you some information about um, going forward. Some things that could impact um, the cost for universal meals if you choose to extend it. Or oh, would it lower it or raise it? <laughs> uh, it's, good, it's good news. <laughs> um, Depends on which yeah. way whether we want to hear it. <laughs> um, so uh, Vermont has been approved to participate in the Medicaid direct certification pilot starting in July of this year. And that pilot is a USDA pilot that um, will allow us to directly certify students for both free meals and reduced price meals, depending on whether their households, or if, if their families participate in Medicaid and fall into those income thresholds in Medicaid. Um, so we've been working with the Department of Vermont Health Access to apply for that pilot and to figure out how we're gonna get that data and send it to schools. The, we haven't started doing actual matches yet, um, so this is very preliminary, but based on the number of students ages um, uh, 5 to 18 that they have in those ranges, in those households under 130% and under 185%, um, we think we may be able to basically replace all of those students who used to apply via applications. Um, and so that we may end up with a back at a statewide free and reduced percentage around 38%. Um, and all those students would be directly certified for free meal, or for free or reduced price meals. And the ones who are directly certified for reduced price, sorry, for free meals, um, those would count for CEP. So those would increase, we talked about the direct certification percentage multiplied by 1.6 and that, that's what gets you to the percent of meals that you can qualify. So yeah. <coughs> you're asking people to do what already exists. Is there, for example, because Diva does eligibility, so before, for example, um, Dr. Dinosaur, which goes up to 300% of poverty, um, do they have the ability to go to in an easy way if you could make it work for the lower percentage 
could they make it work for a higher percentage? They have the ability to pull out a um, hundred, like to pull out who is under 130 and who is under 185, and that's what's allowing us to do this pilot. If we didn't have that data, so we if they were do already that. doing that eligibility though for say like Dr. Dinosaur, um, um, which is 300 percent, you think they could do that? I don't. I can't speak to D, for Diva. Um, I, so it, it, it sounds reasonable to me, but I, I can't speak for what their capability is. <clears throat> but that that could generate more more money from the feds and less money from us if they. Yeah. Up. So that's that's the exciting thing is that um, you know previously we had about eighteen thousand students um, in the state who were directly certified for free meals using mm -hmm. those other sources. Um, Put the numbers in the report, but I want to say that it was twenty-four thousand. I, we should go back and look at the report for sure. But it's a significant, um, significantly higher number of students who would be directly certified for free meals specifically. Um, and then we take that and multiply it by one point six, um, and all of those meals get reimbursed at the free reimbursement rate by the feds, meaning that the state would not need to to pay the universal su meal supplement for those meals. In addition, USDA has just given notice that um, they're going to be issuing a proposed rule in July of this year um, that would presumably go into effect in school year 24-25 that would um, lower the threshold for participating in CEP from 40% of your students being directly certified to some lower number. And we don't know what that number will be until we see the proposed rule. Um, but that is something that USDA actually has authority to do, um, and that will make um, potentially more of our schools eligible for CEP, um, and we might be able to draw down more federal funds that way. So did you say 16% uh, to 24%? No, let me, let me get back 18. in the report and give you actual numbers. I don't have them off the top of my head. I know it's eight, 18,000 eight, Vermont students were previously directly certified. Oops. Well, she's doing it. I'm just trying to think of, you know, the young farmer that was here from East Montpelier, he's got this great website, can buy all sorts of things. You know, I don't know if, if you're the school, it'd be great to just get on and buy or pick it up. You know, there's certain things that you could supply it looks like like that. So how do you help them all kind of make that connection? Because yeah. I think just watching what happened with Farm to Plate, I think that could happen in our schools easily. Um, I can I can speak to that in a second. Um, so it's it we we estimate with Diva's preliminary numbers that about twenty eight thousand students would be directly certified for free meals once we have yeah. So it's a huh. going from eighteen thousand to twenty eight thousand would really oh, increase. That's huge. That's yeah. huge. That's yeah, huge. that's a fifty percent. That's huge. More than yeah. fifty percent increase. And again, we haven't started doing the actual matches yet. But, you know, but yeah. this is very preliminary data showing that this is is really promising. That's so, great. And um, what what's the allowable amount for uh, the feds to pay, or what do they pay? The four fifty or. So they would pay the, the full free reimbursement rate. Um, let me pull See, those numbers up for you. Wow. It seems like the full reimbursement rate is more than the full pay student pays. So I'm not sure, but it seems like I um, remember that from my school board days. Hmm. If you have a free student, yeah. totally free, yeah. you get more money from that particular lunch than you do from Johnny that has to pay his full. You're not food. supposed to. <laughs> um, so there are, are again, you know, there are those federal rules that require that um, those free and reduced meals don't subsidize. Whoops, sorry, I'm trying to do two things at once here. Oh, I um, but didn't you say at the beginning of this that the, the, the students that are paying are not always paying the full price? Um, when we're talking about reduced price students? Well, when you started your conversation here today, mm -hmm. the, the, the students that pay full, full mm -hmm. boat, they, um, I thought you said... Oh, the, the federal government does subsidize those meals. Yes. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Um, so let me give you the reimbursement rates for this that year. Build right into what you said. Yeah. 
Um, so um, the free meal this year, the reimbursement rate um, is $4.41. Um, and the paid reimbursement rate this year is higher than I told you, it's 85 cents. Um, so then it's the difference between those two that gets you what the universal meal supplement is that the state is paying 441 for. versus 431? 441 versus 85 cents. So the difference between those two this year is $3.56. And that's what the feds are paying? No, that's what the state is paying. Okay, states. Yeah. Okay. So, um, yeah. So it's very important to collect that federal money. As much as you can get. Yes, yeah. yeah. I mean, we're still paying the bill, the taxpayers, I guess. And maybe they'll add it to those trillions that they're going to raise the debt limit. So nobody's paying. We're just paying the interest. <laughs> So, <laughs> Senator Campion, you were um, mentioning, you know, getting more local purchasing, um, and one of, you know, that was obviously the goal of the local foods incentive, um, and foods purchases from that that farmer would count towards this. Um, but um, one of the big hurdles for schools is that because these are federally funded programs, they have to follow federal procurement requirements. Um, so it's not just a matter of, you know, uh, I know right. about this farmer, I'm going right. to buy from them. You actually have to check prices in multiple places. Um, and so that additional paperwork yeah. can sometimes be prohibitive. And we've done a lot of training to try and help yeah. schools with that. Um, there are organizations out there that try to help schools with that and try to make it easier. Um, and a lot, you know, the, the various farm school organizations have really, th that's where they're focused, um, is not just making those connections, but making sure that it is easy to prepare <laughs> that food. Um, Would it make sense for, uh, this, I, I don't know, should there be a sort of a designated person just to help with that kind of stuff? I mean, it might sound silly, but gosh, it's just, uh, I, I get it, people are so pressured, and and I just think it's such a win-win when you get kids, you know, eating local. You look at, I, I'm guessing, I'm guessing health rates are better, diets, you know, weights down, can't, you know, all these things are reduced, so I don't know if it, that sort of a preventative thing that you know the state had somebody that just worked on this. I don't, I don't know. Um, I have so in as part of the bill that created the local foods incentive, you gave child nutrition programs an additional position. Okay. That person is responsible for running the local foods incentive grant program. Yep. Provide some technical some assistance. Support. Doesn't do the procurement for them yeah, for sure. Yeah. Like that would be. But they've got somebody on the other line. But but they're there, and then the agency of agriculture does also have somebody who works on farm to school programs okay. um, as well. So there is some support at the state level. Um, maybe not as much as you're envisioning. Um, and there are you know there are creative ideas about could the state procure the product or that sort of thing. But it that can get that's. That's difficult because trying to do that on a statewide level, you're potentially missing out on the little little folks. What I sort of had in mind that we've started talking about is farmers taking their veggies to the food hubs, and then the school lunch program would get have it delivered through the food hubs to the to the different schools on a regular basis, and I should think that that being able to buy it that way would be a lot different than buying it directly the hot lunch uh, business person buying it from farmer A or farmer B or mm -hmm. C mm -hmm. uh, they would call the food hub yeah. or the food hub would call them how many uh, you know carrots or how much lettuce or whatever do you need you know, somebody would take it, whoever takes care of the ordering would make a phone call to the food hub. And that's that's something that does happen um, in some areas. So Food Connects in southern Vermont, they operate um, a, basically a, a, a vending program where the s schools can go in and, and purchase from them. Um, and then they aggregate from a number of farms. And uh, Green Mountain Farm is farm yeah, Green Mountain Farmer School is doing a similar thing as well um, in, in northern Vermont. Um, but again, those are considered to be one vendor, 
Um, and so they have to competitively procure and make sure that From it's that not. One. Well, they have to check prices in multiple places and, and that yeah. sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so um, it's it can be done for sure. Um, it's a little it, it's it's some amount of additional work. And so when you're talking about programs where that director this year, instead of doing that procurement work, is subbing in the kitchen or yeah. on the line, that work it's can't hard. happen when yeah. they're doing that. Yeah. Um, and so that's one of the challenges. But certainly, um, those folks who um, did get that second year local foods incentive grant this year, um, uh, those folks are doing that. They're, they're going out of their way to make sure that they can purchase local foods in order to hit that incentive. So on a, <clears throat> an overall basis, how how do you feel the program went to, you know, has it been working poorly, well, or what could, what might be some other things? I mean, you've told us some things that we need to pay attention to and maybe address, but how's it gone in your mind overall? Universal meals or local foods yeah. incentive? Universal meals. Um, so the, the feedback from the schools and from households has been overwhelmingly positive. Um, you know, folks are really happy to, to have this option. Um, and in talking to my colleagues in other states, so there are, there are um, a handful of other states that have done this um, along with Vermont and are also providing universal meals this year. And then um, the remaining states uh, are, have gone back to charging for meals. And they're reporting some extreme challenges in getting households to return applications or to pay bills. Um, so, you know, it's, it's great that we're not in that situation this year and, and having those difficulties. Um, it was more challenging than I expected to do the provision to base year audits. Um, that took us a longer time than expected. And one concern I have next year is that if we have all these great new um, Medicaid direct cert numbers, we're going to want all our schools to start new base years of provision two. Um, or uh, new CEP cycles in order to take advantage of those numbers. And so that's gonna be an increased um, need of staff on my team next fall to do that. And then in summer of uh, 2024 um, to do the new CEP base years. Um, and doing that will allow us to draw down more federal funding, but it's, it's a lot of additional work on my team. Yeah. Um, and this year we have had to push off a bunch of our federally required administrative reviews to next year in order to get all that work done. So we got a waiver from USDA to allow us to do that, but at some point we can't, you know, it's, it'll have been a long time since, yeah. <laughs> um, so I am concerned about that and just trying to balance um, all that work. But if, um, we, if we go to that from 18 to 20, what, 20, 28, 28 thousand I mean that's a tremendous amount of money mm -hmm. I would think uh, so there should be well there'd be more work involved so of course you need a little more labor involved to, to uh, manage it so um, so so that's one concern I've got for next year um, there I think the the biggest complaints I heard were from independent schools um, and the way that you handled independent schools in Act 151 is that you provided funding for, um, if they were state approved independent school, and I should say independent schools are allowed to participate in the National School Lunch Program as long as they're either state approved or state recognized and are not for profit. Yeah. Um, so we do have about 20 independent schools that do participate in the programs generally. Um, some of those um, were, you know, serving high need students prior to COVID, um, and have, you know, long been doing CEP. Um, but then some of those are like, you know, the academies and, and those sorts of schools. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, the way that you set up funding for independent schools was that um, if the school uh, was state approved and they um, offered universal meals to all of their students, the state pays the universal meal supplement for the. Um, publicly funded students attending that school. Um, so that required some changes to our claiming system in order to be able to make that all work. Um, so we spent about $18,000, not just for the independent school side of things, but to make the universal meal supplement work in our online claiming system. Um, and so those independent schools, um, when they report their claim each month to us, they report um, the number of um, 
public paid publicly funded students, um, uh, the number of meals eaten by those students, um, and then the number of non publicly funded students. Um, they get the federal funds for the non publicly funded students, but then they only get the state universal meal settlement for the publicly funded students. Um, those schools, um, we heard some, some complaints from uh, independent schools that did not have a lot of publicly funded students, um, just feeling that it was not fair. Um, and we also heard some concerns from schools that were not state approved, that are state recognized, um, feeling concerned that they uh, weren't eligible for those funds. I also had a kind of a logistical um, question, which is um, when we're doing CEP or um, uh, the subsequent years of provision two, we're not actually claiming meals based on the, the actual student who ate, it's all percentage. And so um, we couldn't figure out, you know, is this, this particular student publicly funded or not and should they get um, reimbursement for that? So what we came up with, and I'd love some legislative direction about whether this is an appropriate, um, whether this is how you'd like us to handle this going forward, is we had those schools um, who were in that situation report the number of publicly funded students compared to their total enrollment, and we used that to calculate a percentage, and then we applied that percentage to their paid student percentage, um, and that's how we figured out how much to fund them. Um, it seems like a, a good solution, but it wasn't you know, exactly what you asked us to do in terms of funding exactly those meals, because there's just yeah. no way um, to figure out exactly who is eating those meals. That sounds like a pretty fair way of doing it in a quick way. I mean, I think the education committee will probably yeah we can dig into it a little bit as you yeah. want also yeah yeah okay. um, so yeah those were some some general thoughts about um, how you might consider that going forward and then just to keep in mind um, for your cost estimates going forward that USDA updates those meal reimbursement rates every July um, and one of the reasons that um, that the that we're, uh, state funding is costing so much this year is because we didn't expect the reimbursement rate to be as high um, and the difference between those two reimbursement rates to be as high. Um, we based the estimates on last year's reimbursement rates. So that's just something to kind of keep in mind when you're appropriating, knowing that that number, that per meal reimbursement is likely to grow every year um, and just to, to keep that in mind. The way you structured it, it allows for the funding to be paid out, um, but uh, you just wouldn't want to to make an estimate based on um, assuming that will never grow. Well, um, other questions for Rosie? Oh. Thank you. Thanks for everything. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah great thank work. you. It was very, very informative. And, uh, so, I guess we've got some work ahead of us. Yeah. I will say to repeat that it would be helpful if I got some of these numbers down. Sure, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to write those up for you. Yeah. Yeah. And, and obviously, that. you know, that's 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 my math, and you definitely want to bring JFO in oh, and ask them to, yeah, yeah, <laughs> to yeah, check yeah. it. But, uh, um, but I'm, I'm happy to provide you're that you're dealing with yeah. it every day. Yeah, and yeah so yeah. if there are no, uh, no further questions, uh, Thank you very much, and we'll adjourn our meeting.